Thank you, Heath. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome to today's oversight hearing on higher education opportunities for youth aging out of foster care. My name is Councilmember Inez Barron, Chair of the Committee on Higher Education, and I'm joined by the Committee of General Welfare, chaired by my colleague from Brooklyn, Councilmember Steve Levin. Today, a high school diploma alone is no longer sufficient to assure good employment prospects for a solid middle class income. As the United States has shifted from an agrarian to an industrial to a service-based economy with heavy demand for high technology, so have the needs of the labor market. As a result, there is a growing demand for workers with the skills and abilities afforded by post-secondary education, which in turn has contributed to an increasing earnings gap between college and high school graduates. According to an analysis of 2010 census data, 59% of all jobs in the economy require some form of post-secondary education or training. By 2020, it is projected that it will increase to 65%. However, the projection is even higher for New York State, where 69% of all jobs will require some post-secondary education beyond high school. That is, the long-term economic and social health of the state is dependent on New Yorkers' educational attainment. Correspondingly, data show that individuals with higher levels of education tend to have better occupational and economic outcomes than their peers with lower levels of education. This even holds true for people with some college but no credentials when compared to those without any college. On average, earnings increase for each higher academic degree acquired. In 2013, young adults ages 25 to 34 with a bachelor's degree earned 62% more than those with only a high school credential and 103% more than those who did not complete high school. Considered hourly, college graduates make 98% more an hour on average than people without a degree in 2013, up from 85% a decade earlier. This substantial rise in earnings inequality tied to rising returns of educational attainment nearly doubled between 1979 and 2012. College educated individuals not only tend to have higher earnings than people without higher education, they are far less likely to be unemployed and more likely to have health and retirement benefits with their jobs. Beyond the economic advantages afforded by higher education, people with college degrees are more likely to be satisfied with their jobs and healthier than their less educated peers. People with higher education are also more likely to read to their children, better preparing the next generation for school. They are also twice as likely to vote as a peer with only a high school diploma and are more likely to be civically engaged. Overall, a college education not only benefits the individual when it comes to succeeding in today's 21st century economy, but positively impacts society as a whole. With a mission of vital importance as a vehicle to the upward mobility of the disadvantaged in the city of New York, ensuring equal access and opportunity to students, faculty, and staff from all ethnic and racial groups, CUNY plays a key role in elevating poor and working New Yorkers into the ranks of the middle class. However, even getting to the point of a college application process can be challenging for some, and especially for those with a history in foster care. Data show that these students are more likely than their peers to experience low academic achievement and grade retention and lower high school graduation rates. They are at high risk of dropping out of school and have very low rates of college graduation. Numerous studies demonstrate that children who age out of foster care tend to have experienced more, uh, tend to experience worse outcomes than their peers in a variety of critical areas including education, employment, criminal justice involvement, mental health, income insecurity, income security, and housing. Whereas post-secondary education has the ability to enhance these students' well-being as well as their transition to adulthood and increase their chances for personal fulfillment and economic self-sufficiency. From its founding as a free academy in 1847 until the financial crisis of the 1970s, CUNY was committed to providing students of merit a free college education. And since arriving at the council in 2014, I have been committed to trying to restore CUNY to its former glory as the free institution of New York. 
I've spoken extensively about how CUNY's free tuition policy made it possible for me to attend Hunter College in the 1960s. Yes, the 1960s. <laughs> I've held hearings employing, uh, exploring graduation rates and student de debt. Although CUNY asserts that 60% of its graduates leave debt free, that doesn't account for those who dropped out before graduation due to financial issues or the 40% of students that do graduate with debt. Moreover, despite, despite maintaining some of the lowest tuition levels in the country, CUNY educated, relation, educated related costs still can be prohibited to many New Yorkers. That is why we must address the issue of higher education attainment among those of the most vulnerable New Yorkers, youth currently in and youth with a history of foster care. It is of utmost importance that the city does all it can to ensure that these youth have the opportunity to succeed and thrive in school and in life. At this hearing, I'm interested in learning about all of the programs and resources available to students through ACS, CUNY, and any other entity, as well as how CUNY is addressing issues related to persistence and graduation rates among foster care youth. I also am very interested in hearing about the process by which students in foster care learn about specialized supports available to them as a CUNY applicant and take advantage of these specialized resources through graduation. This includes the issue of tuition and fees, housing, the cost of cost materials, transportation, meals, and other education-related issues. Furthermore, I would like to know about the demographic makeup of those students as well as learn about outcomes related to tracking students following graduation. I'd like to acknowledge colleagues of the Committee on Higher Education who are present, and that's Councilmember Cumbo, uh, coming back from her maternity leave, working and loving her baby, and um, okay. Councilmember Gibson was here as well? Okay, great. And now uh, I would like to ha have us hear from Chair Levin for his opening remarks. Thank you very much, Chair Barron. Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Stephen Levin. I'm chair of the Council's General Welfare Committee. I'd like to thank you all for coming to this important hearing on higher education opportunities for youth aging out of foster care. I would like to thank my co-chair today, Inez Barron, chair of the Higher Education Committee for uh, doing this hearing uh, with the General Welfare Committee. I'd also like to acknowledge colleagues from the General Welfare Committee that are here today, Annabelle Palma of the Bronx, uh, Barry Gradenchik of Queens, Adrian Adams of Queens, uh, uh, Councilmember Salamanca, Rafael Salamanca of the Bronx, Councilmember uh, Vanessa Gibson of the Bronx as well, uh, and we expect uh, other council members to join us. Uh, over the past four years, the Council has been very passionate about ensuring the well-being of our youth in foster care, and I'm very proud of the work that we have accomplished so far. In 2014, the Council passed a package of reporting bills pertaining to foster care youth. The Council also hosted two foster youth shadow days in the fall of 2015 and in the spring of 2017. At the first foster youth shadow day in 2015, Council members met with young people and submitted requests for legislation based on conversations and ideas raised by those youth. In 2016, a package of eight bills were enacted into law, which include the following. Local Law 146, sponsored by Councilmember Donovan Richards, which requires ACS to provide a foster care experience survey. This survey was distributed to youth last month, and we hope to see the results of the survey by mid-year of 2018. Local Law 147, sponsored by Councilmember Lori Cumbo, uh, which requires ACS to report the high school graduation rates of foster youth in care. Two pieces of legislation that I was proud to sponsor, Local Law 144, which created the Interagency Foster Care Task Force that began in June of 2017 uh, and is ongoing. And I want to thank Commissioner Farber for leading the way on that, as well as Commissioner Hansel. Uh, and Local Law 142, which requires ACS to report on the educational continuity of children in foster care. I want to acknowledge all of the young people and advocates for their partnership and for all of their hard work to make all of this possible. Look forward to working with this administration, the advocates, and our youth uh, who are in care, who have aged out of care and become advocates themselves to further improve the lives of children involved with the foster care system over the next four years. 
As of September 2017, there were 8,825 youth in New York City's foster care system. During the 2015-16 school year, there were 3,966 foster care youth enrolled in New York City's public high schools, of which 3,353 were still enrolled at the end of the school year and on track to graduate. However, the average school attendance rate for foster youth 16 to 21 was only 37 percent. These vulnerable students face a myriad of challenges that make it very difficult to succeed in high school, much less pursue a college education. National statistics show that 50 percent of foster youth finish high school by age 18, but only 20 percent go on to college and less than 10 percent attain a bachelor's degree. Simply put, we must do more and we must do better. Furthermore, youth who age out of foster care tend to experience worse outcomes than their peers in a variety of critical areas, including education, employment, criminal justice involvement, mental health, income security, and housing. According to the 2015 ACS report on youth in foster care, the latest available data, there were 652 foster youth who aged out of foster care, of which only 160 completed high school and 87 enrolled in college, with 22 of those individuals obtaining a college degree. At today's hearing, the committees will seek to learn more about the various educational programs available to help our city's foster youth attain a college degree and successfully transition into adulthood. The committees will also explore what additional supports are needed to enhance their educational needs, including mentoring services to support the overall well-being of a student involved in the foster care system. And I just want to say, in addition, that every youth that is in care has the ability to graduate high school, enroll in college, and obtain a college degree. Every single youth in care has that ability. And we need to make sure that the opportunities are there and the support services are there, uh, and those wraparound services, every aspect of that uh, is there on the part of the City of New York and our, our not-for-profit partners uh, to be able to support our youth in care to obtain, obtain, obtain those uh, uh, advancements. And I think that I just want to make, make it clear that there's no child, there's no youth in care that doesn't have the ability to do that. Lastly, I'd like to thank the staff of the General Welfare Committee, Andrea Vasquez, Senior Counsel, Tanya Cyrus, Senior Policy Analyst, Dohini Sampora, Finance Unit Head, Daniel Krupp, Finance Analyst, and the staff of the Higher Education Committee for putting this hearing together. I'd also like to thank my Chief of Staff, Jonathan Boucher, and Budget Director, Edward Paulino. And um, with that, I'll turn it back over uh, to my co-chair um, to begin the hearing. Thank you so much, Councilmember Levin. And I want to acknowledge some people as well. Joy Simmons, my Chief of Staff, Amal Wally Clay, my CUNY liaison, Ms. Indigo Washington, Director of Legislation, Chloe Rivera, the Committee's Policy Analyst, and Jessica Ackerman, the Senior Finance Analyst. And I especially want to welcome uh, my colleague, Adrienne Adams. She's new, recently seated here at the Council. I'm glad to be able to be with her today. And also new sitting in today as a council, Mr. Paul Senegal. And so we're going to announce the panel who's here, and he's going to administer the oath. So if you would announce the panel. And we're also joined by Councilmember Jimmy Vaca oh, from the Bronx. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Is he on both our committees? He's just on higher ed. <laughs> okay. Just thank higher you. ed, right, Jimmy? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, and testifying from ACS, we have Julie Farber, uh, Deputy Commissioner, and Kathleen Hoskins, Associate Commissioner. And I'm going to ask Mr. Senegal if he would administer the oath. Please raise your right hand. Uh, in accordance with the rules of the council, I will administer the affirmation to the witnesses from the mayoral administration. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee? and to respond honestly to council members' questions? I do. Please state your names for the record. Julie Farber. Kathleen Hoskins, and I do. Thank you. You may begin. Okay. Yes. Um, 
Thank you, Chair Barron and Chair Levin, um, for, for your opening comments. And we're extremely pleased to be here um, to talk about all, all of the issues um, that, that you raised in your opening comments. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, members of the Committees on General Welfare and Higher Education. I am Julie Farber. I am Deputy Commissioner for Family Permanency Services at ACS, which means I am over the foster care part of the child welfare system. Um, with me today is my colleague, Kathleen Hoskins, who is Assistant Commissioner for the ACS Office of Education Support and Policy Planning. Uh, on behalf of ACS Commissioner David Hansel, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to testify this afternoon. We are very pleased to share more information with the Council about our work to connect young people in foster care with higher education opportunities, work that, as, as Council, Barron, uh, Council Member Barron said, um, is impacting the lives of New York City's young people and, and um, positioning the city as a national leader in this area. Education and workforce opportunities are a central component of ACS's foster care strategic blueprint. This plan identifies our key priorities and strategies for improving case practice and results for children and families in the foster care system from family reunification to kinship placement to adoption to supporting older youth and we are tracking and reporting our results. Um, as you may have seen yesterday, uh, ACS released our fiscal year 17 blueprint status report. I happen to have one handy and we distributed one to, to all of you. Um, and this report highlights the significant progress being made. As we continue to aggressively implement this blueprint, the reforms are yielding promising results across the foster care system that I will discuss and, and touch on here and then drill down into the education and workforce readiness supports and resources that ACS offers for our youth in care um, in partnership with our providers and of course with CUNY um, and other key partners. ACS and the de Blasio administration remain focused on improved outcomes for young people in foster care through significant programs and investments that are targeted to advance the goals that are outlined in this blueprint. And we really thank the council for its leadership and partnership in this effort and want to acknowledge um, Chair Levin, who, who already touched on this, um, for his role in the shaping the work of the foster care task force that Commissioner Hansel is chairing. The task force is currently producing its report for the council and the mayor containing actionable recommendations, including recommendations to further advance our work around education and employment outcomes for young people in foster care. And we, we look forward to sharing that report um, and working with you um, in the coming months. I also would like to acknowledge my team of dedicated child welfare professionals at ACS, our foster care agency partners, the advocacy community, and the young people themselves who are striving for success, whose voices are essential to these initiatives, and really are the entire reason why all of us, why, why all of us are here today. There are few responsibilities that are more important than caring for children who have faced the trauma of abuse and neglect and have been removed from their families. Our mission is to achieve the goals of safety, permanency, and well-being for every child in foster care. This is why we've built a system that's data-driven, it's evidence-based, and we're using trauma-informed practices. ACS continues to strengthen and support families and keep children with their families when safely possible. As I think you know, the population of children in foster care, as Council Member Levin mentioned, remains at a historic low um, with 8,825 children in care as of September 2017. When children must be placed in foster care, ACS works closely with our foster care provider agencies to make sure that children and families are receiving targeted services and supports. As a result, the majority of children that enter foster care return home to their families. In FY17, more than 2,000 children were reunified. Additionally, um, and we're, we're very proud of this and, and, and uh, going to be continually working to, to increase this, the number of children exiting care through kinship guardianship, otherwise known as KinGAP, increased um, by 10.2% uh, from 343 children last year to 378 children this year. Um, and that's up from, I think, 119 children you know, four years ago. So there's a steady, uh, a steady trend up, um, and there's more opportunity for us there. The city also successfully advocated in support of state legislation 
that will keep uh, that, that will increase the availability of KinGap for children in foster care, particularly older youth. Um, under the current law, uh, as you may know, kinship guardians were narrowly defined as having to be related by blood. Uh, you know, you know, fictive kin did not count. Um, and guardians could only receive payments up to the child's 18th birthday if the guardianship took place after the young person was 16. So the new law has corrected those issues. And so once the new law goes into effect, kinship guardianship payments will be available to all, to the guardians of all children up to age 21, as opposed to it stopping for some, some children at age 18. Additionally, the law does expand to include fictive kin, um, which is, um, uh, a good thing for kids and, and we're excited to implement that. The new law will allow more children, including older youth, there's a real opportunity here for older youth, um, to achieve permanency while remaining connected to the important people in their lives. And families will have access to more financial resources to care for children with kin gap subsidies. In FY217, uh, 899 children were adopted. ACS is working with our foster care agencies and other stakeholders to reduce the time to adoption by streamlining a range of administrative processes. We're extremely proud and excited that um, we have launched an $11 million partnership with the Dave Thomas Foundation. The city is contributing um, almost $4 million and the foundation is contributing $7 million. And that initiative is focused on increasing the numbers of um, young people with special needs and older youth and sibling groups who achieve permanency through either adoption or kinship guardianship. So, as we make solid progress on, on these permanency outcomes, um, we very much appreciate the committee's focus on the vulnerable population of older youth in care. While most children and youth in foster care do return home or are adopted or achieve permanency through kin guardianship, every young person situation um, obviously includes its own unique circumstances and some young people transition out of foster care to independent living. The proportion of young people in foster care age 16 and older with what we call an APLA goal, um, that's the federal um, name for another permanent planned living arrangement. It's what used to be called an, a goal of independent living. So these are the young people who um, have, a, have a goal of independent living. So the, the proportion of young people in foster care age 16 and older um, uh, dropped um, by 5%, um, which is uh, obviously a good direction that we're heading in. These young people who are sometimes described as aging out of care receive assistance from ACS and our community partners um, with medical and mental health services, housing, education, vocational opportunities, um, clearly our goal is to connect them to the vast array of resources and supports at ACS, at the foster care agencies, and in the communities as they transition out of care and into adulthood. Um, importantly, this network of supports includes the opportunity for youth to remain in care even beyond age 21. So New York is one of the jurisdictions in the country that foster care extends to 21 and we even go beyond 21 through an exception to policy. So while the federal government um, and, and New York State funds end at 21, New York City will continue to support young people in foster care um, through city tax levy after age 21. ACS has successful programs underway that help young people in foster care um, and who are transitioning out to advance their education and goals. I will now uh, turn to discussing um, uh, the work we are doing um, to plan for education success, uh, the work we're doing offering innovative targeted supports for young people in college, and the work we're doing building workforce readiness while creating pathways to employment. So the office that um, Kathleen Hoskins runs, the Office of Education Support and Policy Planning, works to engage stakeholders early and throughout a child's school career to plan for education success. The office provides training, resources, direct technical assistance to frontline casework staff, including staff at the, our contracted provider agencies. Uh, the office also collaborates very closely, of course, with DOE um, and working um, to promote school stability for children in foster care and supporting the educational needs of all youth involved in child welfare services. Nationally, um, as the council members mentioned, we do know that youth in foster care have poorer educational outcomes than their peers. 
Um, and this is why uh, we need to double down around our supports for young people in foster care in particular. So to tackle challenges for our city's youth in care around attendance, around school performance, high school graduation, college persistence, ACS um, uh, in partnership with, with CUNY and others um, is implementing a range of strategies, um, including partnering with the DOE, our partnerships with CUNY, increasing education specialists and resources within the foster care system that are solely devoted to focusing on the educational needs of young people in foster care, and arming foster parents and caregivers and young people themselves with concrete information and resources. In, 2000, in the fall of 2017, ACS and DOE partnered to create the Tiered Response Attendance Monitoring Program that enhances communication between DOE and the ACS provider agencies when students have a certain threshold of absences. This protocol covers foster youth in grades K through eight and provides for earlier and targeted intervention to address attendance issues that can start in the lower grades and then can lead to chronic absenteeism in high school. In addition to the protocol, we're seeing increased notifications to parents or caregivers and ACS when concerns arise regarding older children as well. So there's a number of um, exciting initiatives that we wanna highlight for you. Um, in the summer of 2017, ACS, in partnership with CUNY Staten Island and with First Star, which is a national organization working to improve outcomes for older youth in foster care, implemented the First Star Academy at CSI that is uh, designed to support a group of rising ninth grade students successfully through high school all the way to college. So ninth graders are identified and start the program in ninth grade and participate in programming both during the school year and on campus during the summer. Um, and they are in the program for their entire high school experience um, with the idea being that um, we will prepare them um, to enter college. Um, and First Star has um, very, very impressive outcomes. And so we're very excited to have the opportunity to launch this program. So we've enrolled um, 24 students into the First Star Academy. As I mentioned, it extends through four years of high school. Um, and this summer, students worked on and improved their skills in core subject areas like algebra and writing. Um, and they engaged in a variety of enriching activities on campus and in the community. I had the opportunity this summer to um, attend one of the summer sessions, um, and the young people are um, really impressive group of young people that are participating in the program. Um, so to increase the involvement of parents and foster parents, and this is critical in students' education, ACS released a Foster Parents Guide to Education in the fall of 2017. And I have a copy of this guide here. It's a beautiful guide, and we're looking forward to sharing copies um, with all of the council members. And I think one, one of your questions, Council Member Barron, related to you know, how do we make sure that everyone is getting the information? Um, and so the creation of this guide is one piece um, of that strategy. Um, about providing information um, about rights, responsibilities, opportunities, um, and services related to young people in foster care and their, and their education. Um, we are, um, as I mentioned, um, completing a companion database um, by the spring of 2018 um, that will also ultimately will have an app um, moving forward um, where students and foster parents and parents um, will be able to search um, for educational services. So we're, we're proud of this document. In the last three years, um, our foster care provider agencies have increased access points to work with families um, by developing new education support offices with about 135 staff exclusively devoted, devoted to um, educational issues for children in foster care across the 27 agencies. ACS continues to track the outcomes um, for young people in foster care who go to college. We are very pleased to share that as of fall 2017, we have uh, 355 young people who are enrolled in two and four year college programs at CUNY, SUNY and other private school and out of state programs. So this 
represents uh, almost 30% of young people in foster care age 18 and older. Um, as an, I think the council member mentioned nationally, um, only about 20% of young people in foster care are in college and we're at about 30%. We're not stopping there, um, but we are, um, you know, in terms of the national scale, ahead of the curve. Um, further, we have established partnerships to remove financial barriers so that young people in foster care can enter and persist in college. We have data matches with CUNY as well as coordination with the Higher Education Services Corporation and the New York State Office of Children and Families so that we can complete a statewide match for tuition assistance program TAP eligibility. And we work to make sure that all of our students are maximizing financial aid and all of the supports available to them. Beyond traditional financial assistance, young people receiving ACS services can apply for the federal uh, education and training vouchers, the ETVs. Um, and receive up to $5,000 per year until age th uh, 23 for items such as tuition, student fees, room and board, books and supplies. In the fall of 2017, um, 379 current and former foster youth received the federal ETV funds with assistance from ACS. In addition, the nonprofit agency New Yorkers for Children partners with ACS to provide educational support for young people in foster care, including college scholarships, needs-based emergency funds, and a back-to-school package with a laptop, metro card, and gift cards for textbooks. When a young person leaves foster care to attend college outside of the city, ACS provides college room and board payments up to the amount of the monthly foster care subsidy to offset costs. And in FY 2017, ACS provided 37 students over the age of 21 with financial supports for dorm and meal plan fees or off-campus rent. Additionally, the program helps students who are away at college and return to the city on school breaks by providing a foster home to the student during those times when campus may be closed. I want to move now to talk about our work and partnership with CUNY. Um, and before I, I get into the substance of it, I just want to say on behalf of Commissioner Hansel and um, First Deputy Commissioner Eric Brettschneider, I want to acknowledge and thank our amazing um, partners on this initiative, Chancellor Millikan and his team at CUNY, including Judy Bergstrom and Donna Linderman, who is testifying today. Queen College President, Queen's College President Felix Matos Rodriguez, College of Staten Island President William Fritz, City College of New York President Vincent Boudreau. I want to acknowledge our partner Bill Baccalini, uh, who's sitting on the end there and will be testifying later, and the entire New York Foundling team that is, um, you'll, you'll hear about this in, in both of our testimonies, um, but providing 24-7 uh, wraparound support to the young people at CUNY. Um, and I want to acknowledge Janine Balfour and the Conrad Hilton Foundation that is providing significant support for these efforts. Finally, I want to acknowledge Malik Mia, who's sitting there next to Bill, and he is one of the incredible students in the program who will be testifying later today. Um, and, and really hearing from him is the best way to understand the impact of this program. So in terms of the Foster and College Success Initiative, um, building on our higher education supports, in 2017, ACS was extremely pleased to launch Foster and College Success Initiative with two uh, programs that are specifically designed to meet the needs of students who remain in foster care while attending college. This initiative began with a baseline multi-year investment from the city that builds up to 2.7 million in FY 2019. In partnership with CUNY and the New York Foundling, what we call the DORM Project, um, supports our goal to increase post-secondary enrollment and college graduation rates for young people in care. We conduct outreach with foster care agencies about the program, accept applications, enroll foster youth, some of whom uh, may be entering college for the first time or continuing their education. The first group of 50 foster youth who participated in the program were enrolled in academic programs at 10 CUNY colleges across the city and were residing in the Queens College and College of Staten Island dormitories. 
In FY 2018, the residential component expanded to the City College of New York. The program doubled in size to almost 100 students, and it will continue to grow in FY 2019. Currently, we are serving, uh, as I said, almost 100 students, 93 young people with complete financial support, on-campus housing, and critically, targeted wraparound services that you'll hear more about from our, our partner, the New York Foundling. Students are matched with the various CUNY programs tailored to their individual needs and that specialize in supporting youth in foster care with academic advisement and social supports. For example, CUNY's Accelerated Study in Associate Programs, ASAP, very well-known program, is committed to graduating at least 50% of students within three years and has proven to be one of CUNY's most successful community college initiatives with students in the program graduating at a rate more than double that of similarly situated students. We currently have 37 dorm project students enrolled in ASAP and our partners from CUNY are here today and can describe more about ASAP as well as other CUNY programs that are supporting our young people in foster care. Another key component, as I mentioned, of the dorm program is the provision of 24-7 wraparound support to the students. ACS has partnered with the New York Foundling to deliver comprehensive support services 24-7 to the students living on all three campuses. New York Foundling College success coaches reside on site at the dorm locations and provide success dr driven guidance to enhance each student's advocacy and agency skills. The coaches work with students to navigate the complexities and challenges of being a college student. They provide assistance with workforce readiness. They connect students to internship opportunities in collaboration with CUNY, as well as professional mentorship opportunities with external partners, such as Goldman Sachs and Casey Family Programs. As I mentioned, New York Foundling is here today, um, and you'll also be hearing from Malik um, uh, about his experience um, uh, firsthand in the program. The dorm project um, is an innovative approach to promoting the well-being of young people in foster care by helping them become educationally competitive and ready for the workforce. Highlights from the first year include students achieving A's and B's increased in both semesters. We had increases in GPA, we had increases in credits. We are also tracking, um, obviously very closely, the issue of persistence. We're very excited to report that for students who's joined the dorm program at the moment they began their college, they had not been in college previously, their semester to semester persistence rate is 82%, um, which is really significant. The overall persistence is um, for, for all young people in the program, which includes some young people who had already started college before they joined the dorm program, is 57%. I think I had 57%. Um, so what this, which is also astounding when you look at persistence rates of, of um, youth in foster care uh, across the country in college, but what the 82% says to us is that you know if we get students right at the outset, um, we're really um, producing um, extremely important outcomes um, that will have impact on young people. So we're really looking forward to you know, continuing to share more results on that. The other program is the Fostering College Success College Stipend Program. So to provide further support for students, we rolled out the Fostering College Success uh, Stipend Program in FY 2017. This investment opens the door of opportunity for foster youth in college by offering a daily stipend that students can use for essentials like personal items, phone payments, transportation, clothing, food, books that aren't covered for financial aid and scholarship funding. ACS has funded more than $1.9 million as part of the city's baseline investment in fostering college success programs. With this critical financial assistance, students are not having to worry about how they're going to afford X, Y, or Z, and they're able to focus on their studies and um, enjoy the college experience, engage in on-campus uh, activities, and fully benefit from the experience in college that we all want youth in foster care to have. 
Additionally, students in the program are gaining financial literacy skills through tools that are designed to help them organize and track their spending. I now want to move, uh, just have a little bit more, um, to talk about um, our work around workforce readiness and creating pathways to employment. Last year, um, we established a new Office of Employment and Workforce Development Initiative. This is, again, one of the priorities of our foster care blueprint. Um, and this office um, is dedicated uh, and designed to improve um, youth employment outcomes um, by developing programs and initiatives with our foster care agencies, with um, private foundation partners, and with our other sister agencies to advance the workforce readiness skills of our young people in foster care and prepare them for employment. So a couple of examples of the work that this office has done. Um, this office has been prolific um, over the last year and a half. Um, in the spring of 2016, we partnered with the Department of Youth and Community Development, DYCD, to launch the Young Adult Internship Plus program, YIP Plus. So you may be familiar that DYCD has a, an existing YIP program. So ACS worked with DYCD to develop a program that built on that model, um, but added the kinds of supports and services that um, are necessary for young people in foster care given their particular circumstances and experience of trauma. So of the, we've had a, a hundred current and former foster youth have enrolled, 90% have completed all the program requirements. More than half completed their internships and were hired into permanent jobs. An additional 30% continue to advance their educational goals. We're also very proud to report that ACS referred more than 750 youth to DYCD's summer youth employment program. Um, we had a, a deep investment there. Um, we had 50 young people at ACS itself um, uh, having an SYEP placement at, at ACS as well. In addition to these activities, we're continuing to innovate with cutting edge models to enhance the outcomes for young people in our system. We're providing on-site TA and capacity building to our foster care agencies and internships for youth through several new partnerships, and I'll just mention a couple of them. Six of our foster care agencies are implementing the Young Adult Work Opportunities for Rewarding Careers, YA Work model, with intensive support and training from the Workplace Center at Columbia University. This program provides agency staff with training and hands-on technical assistance to conduct career planning, develop career club peer groups, utilize labor market employment strategies, and develop relationships with employers. To date, more than 100 youth have been enrolled in that program. ACS has also partnered with the Pinkerton Foundation to implement a mentored internship program. The foundation has provided eight foster care agencies with funding for dedicated staff, and they've engaged professional development organizations to provide capacity building and training for foster care agency leadership. The goal is to have 200 young people that are in supported internships, either at the foster care agencies themselves or in um, you know, community um, locations. So we're very excited about that program. We're also a partner in two major initiatives that are launching now. In October, you may have seen that the Manhattan District Attorney announced a commitment of $3.75 million to two agencies that work with foster youth, Graham Windham and The Door, to enhance and expand innovative programs, including education and employment services for youth transitioning out of care. New Yorkers for Children, ACS, and a national nonprofit called Youth Villages are also partnering to implement YV LifeSet, which is a nationally recognized model to improve outcomes for older youth in care. New Yorkers for Children applied to a national competition on behalf of ACS, and New York City was awarded match funding to implement YV LifeSet in partnership with two foster care agencies over the next three years. This model will roll out to two pilot agencies in spring 2018, and we look forward to updating the council about the impact of that program. 
In closing, um, we appreciate the opportunity to discuss higher education opportunities for youth in our system, including those aging out of care. We are proud of the work we have done to create and sustain these vital programs that support youth in care in achieving their higher education and employment goals. We're pleased to partner with the City Council in our continuing efforts to improve the foster care experience of our city's youth so that each young person can successfully pursue a path of education, enrichment, and independence. We're happy to take your questions. Thank you so much. We want to acknowledge we've been joined by council members Corey Johnson, Jamani Williams, and Fernando Cabrera. And we're going to begin the questioning with my colleague, Council Member Levy. Thank you very much, Chair Barron. Um, so Commissioner Farber, I, I know that you are uh, somewhat time limited. Uh, so do you prefer to answer questions now and then and then we will have uh, representatives from CUNY testify? Is that how yes, you prefer? Yes, that would be great if that's okay. That is okay. Is that, that okay? Is okay. And then, um, <laughs> and then uh, Commissioner Hoskins, perhaps you, are you able to stay uh, when CUNY is testifying so that you could answer follow-up questions as well? Sure. Great. Um, okay, so <laughs> I think, um, and so that was a, obviously very comprehensive testimony um, and so I think uh, I think I guess where I'd like to start is um, uh, before we get into higher education uh, uh, during uh, secondary education um, the the percentage the the um, uh, Um, the attendance rate uh, that uh, we're looking at in uh, youth in care, um, the data that we have, the most recent data, has 71% attendance rate for foster, for youth in foster care ages 11 to 15. That falls off a cliff uh, down to 37% among youth 16 to 21. Um, what is accounting for that drop off? Um, and whose responsibility is it within the system uh, to ensure that 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 youth are continuing um, with a uh, higher attendance rate? Um, is it uh, somebody at the high school itself? Is it the foster parent? Mm -hmm. Is it the foster care agency? Is it a combination of the three? Mm -hmm. um, and how does that all work? And and obviously, I mean, I, I can't imagine that. It's anybody's position uh, that 37% is an acceptable number. Um, so, uh, what are we doing around that uh, as a you know first and foremost? Yeah, certainly. Thank you for that question because that's obviously an issue of, of great concern to us. Um, so, a I'll say a couple of things and then I'll ask Kathleen um, to fill in, but. What's critically important to understand um, when young people aren't attending school is to under, understand what's underlying that, right? I mean, so first of all, if you have a, a second grader that's not attending school, that's probably a different issue than if you have an 11th grader that's not attending school, right? And so Kathleen will describe the, the partnerships that we have with DOE and with our foster care agencies, um, but the the, um, it, it is a partnership among ACS, DOE, and the foster care agencies to identify young people that are having attendance issues and then to conference around those young people and figure out what, what the underlying issues are. Are they running away from something at the school? Are they running to something else? Um, and then understanding what those issues are. You know, are, are, is it mental health issues? Is it... Um, you know, a, a social issue at school. Um, and, and so it, it's important to understand on a case-by-case -case basis what's impacting, why isn't the young person going to school. So I'll let Kathleen talk a little bit about the systems, um, which are fairly intense, that we have in place for tracking attendance and then following up um, on individual young people. Thank you, Julie. So. Um, you know, we've noticed that this percentage is, is fairly low and obviously we're committed to increasing it. I think the first part of where we wanted to target our intervention is making sure that the agencies understand which kids are uh, falling into, you know, sort of less than 50% attendance rate. So just having the information 
um, and being able to target it. So we've been working with the Department of Education. We have a data match that we have that um, details all of the kids in foster care as they're assigned to each agency. Every month we distribute that data to the foster care agencies and we have a meeting with them um, on how to sort of uh, attack and um, increase and look at what are some of the issues that kids are facing um, when their attendance is low. Um, and then we do individual assessments. So we may take an agency, uh, we look at the data, we have them discuss sort of what are some of the interventions that they're putting in place um, for these youth. I will say we have seen some trends um, in terms of these students having attendance issues prior to them coming into foster care, so we have to do a better job of identifying them um, uh, as soon as they enter care. But after, after they're in, we're very committed to bringing up their attendance record. So identification is the first piece. The second piece is working with the Department of Education around um, informing kids of specialized programs. So that includes uh, District 79 alternative programs. So for example, um, they just opened the Judith K School this year where they're targeting um, as part of their school population kids in foster care system who are either who are overaged and unaccredited or overaged for grades. So for example, eighth grade students that may be 15, 16 years old um, or uh, students who are 17, 16, 17 years old and may not be going to school because they don't feel like they can complete um, because they're behind. So we're working with District 79 to target. We also are working with agencies uh, around transfers in um, school, uh, student transfers into transfer high schools. So as long as they've attended high school for one year, we sort of work with the agencies to prepare them to interview for transfer high schools. Um, and sometimes we will, my office directly will provide direct advocacy in terms of connecting with the school, talking about the student, and um, sort of supporting their application for transfer high school. So that's specific for the older population. Um, are you seeing, so, you know, because those numbers widely, you know, there's a wide discrepancy from 71 down to 37 percent, um, for youth that are, that have been in care from, you know, either before their age 11 straight through into, you know, into um, perhaps an, an, an APLA uh, framework, um, are they, are we seeing uh, among that cohort um, of youth that have been in, have been in care for extended periods of time? their attendance rates declining. So not just, in, in, in other words, not, not comparing two separate cohorts, the same cohort mm -hmm. over time. Are we seeing a decline in their attendance rates from age 15 to, or 11 to 15 and then, and then 16 and older? Um, I don't have that data in right. front of me, but that's- Sorry, if you could sorry, detail. Sorry. I don't have that data in front of me, um, but that's certainly something that we can look and see if we can produce. I mean, and, and I get where you're going with the question. Um, you know, we, we want to look at sort of the, the long stayers in care versus the young person who might have come into care at age 15. Right. Um, and there's a fair number of those young people, and some of those young people are coming into care on what we call voluntaries. Um, yep. Right, so you understand that issue, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that tends to be in the situation where a parent is having trouble um, managing the young person, but we can certainly look at the data for you, council member. And then who's responsibility is it both within a school setting and at a foster agency um, to to ensure that um, that a youth in care is getting specific support that they need that they need uh, that might be unique to them so for example um, you know um, there's a young person who um, I was interning in my office okay. and when he was in high school um, he, it was the guidance counselor at his high school was the one that that uh, was reached out to him was that bedrock that he needed mm -hmm. through that time that very difficult time when he was in high school um, you know is it always the guidance counselor is it a, is it maybe a teacher uh, what is doe doing I mean maybe you know perhaps we should have you know sh doe should be answering questions as well but what is doe specifically doing? Who are they training? What type of training are they doing uh, to support youth in care outside of maybe the you know D seventy five or seventy nine, mm -hmm. but just within um, just within the general uh, high school population? And then and then who at the foster care agencies is responsible? Because frankly, the foster care agency that he was with wasn't doing that. Mm -hmm. So you know, it did it 
luckily somebody picked up the ball uh, in his case. But you know, who's who's there to be responsible? At, you know, so there's some redundancy in that effort. So the foster care agency case planner is absolutely responsible for you know tracking every kid you know on their on their caseload and their educational needs, their mental health needs, their their medical needs, right? So. That is, um, you know, one you know very critical point of responsibility, and then obviously the you know the DOE has um, you know a level of responsibility and, and functions that it implements around um, students that are either truant or um, you know having academic issues, um, and then um, as Kathleen mentioned with the data match that we have monthly between ACS and DOE, we are you know, systematically every month identifying where there are attendance issues and, and following up on those issues. And I'll add Kathleen add to that and you can talk a little bit more maybe about the tiered attendance protocol and um, DOE and ACS's relative responsibilities in that protocol. Right, and, uh, and as Commissioner Farmer uh, mentioned before, um, every now in the last four years, I think um, foster care agencies have really pushed to increase specific education support personnel. Right. Um, and they are critical in terms of making sure that every student is targeted. And at least every foster care agency has at least one person. Um, but most have multiple people working on um, tracking the education outcomes to support the case planners, right. sort of as an as a expertise um, in support. Um, and so we definitely look to them uh, to help and support um, the agency as a whole around education. Um, DOE has done um, quite a bit to partner with us. Uh, as mentioned earlier, we have the tiered response protocol, which is an attendance monitoring program. Um, while it's specific through kindergarten through eighth, we found that because our agency, uh, my office specifically, is part of that protocol and outreach um, for particular students, uh, both students in tier two and tier three, which cover kids in foster care, we've been also receiving calls from high schools to say, hey, we have this student, we know that you know they're not on the tier protocol, but we have the data match, we know they're in foster care, and we sort of have you know maybe some concerns or let's have a collaborative case planning meeting to address whatever um, may be hindering attendance. Every month, we also have something called the ACS DOE collaboration meeting where schools can actually request case planning meetings and the ACS partner, which in this case would be the foster care agency, come to the table to plan collectively with uh, the Department of Education staff. Um, lastly, I wanna mention that we've sort of had a um, intense rollout of professional development for all DOE staff, um, specifically parent coordinators, but we've been doing this training across um, all touch points of schools, including principals, assistant principals, guidance counselors, and social workers. And we created a curriculum called the cross-system collaboration. So trying to get school staff to understand how our system works, where our touch points are, um, particularly around uh, kids in foster care, we've been tra um, training them on school stability, um, the fact that there are education point people at the foster care agencies, and for our high school students, what are some of these sort of specialized programs that we've partnered with and created so that when high schools are doing college planning, um, in addition, um, high school planning for the high school application, that they understand our system, understand some of the specific needs of our kids in foster care, and can service them appropriately. So we're sort of trying to um, have multiple touch points with the Department of Education around supporting kids in care. Um, and then just last question on, on that matter. Uh, so that data of 37% of was from t uh, the 2015-16 school year. Um, is there an objective uh, number that ACS is working towards as a target uh, in terms of bringing that attendance rate up? And I mean, are, are, is that something that you're continually measuring? Um, but I f first off, is there, is, there an, is there a target number? It's certainly something that we're continually measuring, um, and um, we're, we're a fan of target setting, um, and, and we're looking at that, but we don't have one yet to report. Okay, um, maybe we could follow up on that, because obviously we wanna get that, that number up, and you know this administration has four years to go, so we would like to <laughs> see a kind of um, you know consistent improvement. Yeah, so. appreciate that. Um, uh, Changing topics for a moment here. Um, 
is there is there data, clear data that, that you have to show that um, kin gap is uh, improves educational outcomes? Um, and is that I mean obviously there are a myriad of benefits to kin gap over foster care, but is there are there specific educational outcomes that uh, you can speak to? So. Um, I don't have that um, off the top of my head, but we, we may have that as part of the, all the research that we've gathered around kin gap. I mean, certainly um, it's been shown to improve well-being outcomes mm -hmm. um, and stability and um, obviously reduce trauma, mm -hmm. um, but I'd be happy to look at that for you and get back to you. Okay, I'd be interested to see that. Um, and let's see, next question, again, changing topics. So, um, Commissioner Farber, you, had, in your testimony, outlined an array of services. A lot of these are new programs mm -hmm. uh, just over the last year or two that have been rolled out, partnership with foundations, partnership with CUNY. Um, uh, how, how are you ensuring that all of these programs are getting to um, the the youth, I mean, it, uh, you know, the, to, to identify which ones work best or are most appropriate for each uh, youth in care, how are, you, how are you getting that information to them? And then what role does a foster care agency have with supplying that information to those youth? Uh, you know, because honestly, it ends up being kind of an alphabet soup, right? There's everything has an acronym. And, um, you know, there's just, it, it, since everything's new, it might just be kind of a you know, yeah. it's not, it shouldn't just be up to them to navigate. So how, yeah. how are we doing this in a comprehensive way, in a very user-friendly way? And you mentioned that an app. Yeah. Um, uh, is there anything else yeah. uh, specifically where uh, the agency has some kind of responsibility there? Yeah, so it's a good challenge to have, right? Uh, you know, in that um, it's great that we have so many programs and resources and services, mm -hmm. but it is a, a legitimate challenge to figure out how to package all of that information for all the case planners and all of the agencies and for all of the youth themselves in a way that's understandable. So there's a couple of different, you know, we have a multi-pronged strategy to get that information out. So one of those strategies is this, right? This is the Foster Parent Guide to Education and I'm excited for it. You have a palm card in front of you for mm -hmm. it, but um, we're excited to, to share these um, printed copies when they're when it's finalized because this takes information about 30 different areas that um, relate to educational services and supports and puts it in one place. And mm -hmm. here's who you call, and here's you know where you can get information. So that's one, one set of strategy. The other thing I mentioned is we're creating a, you know, an online clearinghouse um, that um, you know will, will be a website mobile enabled, and then ultimately the next phase will be to have it as an app um, where parents, foster parents, and young people will be able to search for services, not just on education, but on you know mm -hmm. all sorts of services. Um, the other piece um, of providing information, um, uh, which is critical, and, and you mentioned the, the role of the foster care agencies. I mean, clearly it is the, the responsibility of the foster care agencies to um, receive this information and share this information um, with young people and with foster parents and to help support that Kathleen's office meets on a monthly basis with all of the education specialists at the foster care agencies and so those are really rich packed agendas um, mm -hmm. because there's a lot to share um, mm -hmm. you know which is a good thing um, we also at our quarterly foster care directors meetings have for example DYCD came and presented to all of our foster care directors about the YAIP plus program mm -hmm. um, so um, the, the other thing um, that we're, we're working on um, is being able to contact youth directly ourselves from ACS. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the things that we were successful in doing after the hackathon that we held last year um, was we advocated to the state to add a field in connections where we could add email addresses for the young people. I mean, when Connections was created, um, there was no field. Uh -huh. um, and so they did it. And so that is in there. And so now we are just now working with our foster care agencies to have email addresses entered for all of the young people 
so as well as as phone numbers so that you know and young people text right and yeah. so we're looking at ways you know what can we get out you know a very brief piece of information on text Right, mm -hmm. because we want to make sure we hit it at all directions. We want to make sure that the foster care agencies are providing the information. We want to go directly to the foster parents, and we want to go directly to the youth themselves. Right, because there are instances, many instances, where you know, especially with youth that are mm -hmm. uh, older youth um, that may not be in a long-term foster home right. scenario. Um, obviously, the youth that are in group homes, yep. you know, that doesn't. That doesn't apply, you know, at all. There is no foster care, really. So, um, but but it, you know, in particular, if there's a youth that's that's you know, 15, 16 years old, mm -hmm. and is in a kind of, uh, you know, less than permanent foster um, uh, uh, situation, yeah. you know, it's it, I think you know we don't want to rely obviously just on the foster parent, right, or primarily on the foster right. parent to get that information to them. They're 15, right. 16 years old. They, you know, are. You know they're they're certainly capable of, right. of, um, of getting this information on their own and applying on their own with, with just the right support yeah. or at the right at the right touch point. Yeah. Well, certainly though, you know, youth who are in group homes, it would be the foster care agency staff, right, that mm -hmm. that are you know running that program that would still have the same case management and case planning responsibility to share information mm -hmm. with the young person about their education. But um, you know the opportunity to send young people information directly, yeah. um, you know, in the information age through you know text and email, right. you know, will be really powerful and empowering. Right, but it's the follow up. It's that kind of maintenance of that information. That That's right, because email addresses and phone numbers change. And right, and right, also just yeah. you know something comes into your email box, and if there's not the follow up yes. email or there's not the follow up phone call or meeting. Right. You know, to go over, hey, what exactly is that, and how does it apply to me? Yes. Um, you know, I think that that's right. The, well, know, that's the responsibility of our foster care agencies, right? right? Whoever the case planner is right. assigned to that young person, and then they can get technical support from the educational specialist that works at their agency, who's going to know and um, be an expert on that. And and just lastly, and then I'll, yeah. I'll turn it over to my co-chair. That it, so, what's the accountability then measure with the foster care agencies mm -hmm. to ensure that they're actually doing that? Yeah. So um, is there mm -hmm. you know is there um, incentives, you know, is there, is there a way to make sure that there's, um, when, their, when their contract is reviewed, um, you know, that there's that outcome is, 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 uh, is, a, is a, a measure of, of quality? Yeah, yeah. So um, there's a couple of things. Um, one, I want to uh, mention, um, since you were one of the co-sponsors of this bill, but an important um, accountability piece is the youth survey that we're mm -hmm. implementing. Um, and so we have rolled it out uh, in a pilot. Mm -hmm. It's actually being piloted at the New York Foundling right now, one of our large foster care agencies. Um, and will go live to all of the foster care agencies by the end of the year. And that mm -hmm. is a survey of all youth in care age 13 and over. Um, and I think you've seen a copy of the survey. Um, and and we're, we're very excited about that. It collects information about young people's experience in foster homes, in group homes, with education, with uh, work readiness. And so... You know, a, a key piece of accountability um, is, is hearing from young people themselves. Um, so that will, you know, is one one important piece of accountability. Um, you know, a ACS, as, as I think you know, has um, a fairly extensive, um, you know, provider accountability um, monitoring um, mechanism, um, and so education in terms of whether young people are um, in need of special services, receiving special services, whether their foster parents are adequately engaged, um, if they have foster parents, as, as most of our kids do, since we have very few kids that are in residential placements. Um, all of that kind of information is collected as part of the statistically representative case record review that we do, it's, which is called PAMS. Um, and it's the, the PAMS review of all of our foster care agencies and that information um, contributes to the scorecard, which you know, which you've all seen. And so, education. There's a there's a whole section in that um, review um, that measures agencies' performance on that, and that is tracked and monitored. Okay, I'll turn it over to my co-chair. Uh, thank you, Council Member. I have a lot of questions, so I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna do the quick presentation, okay. Okay. and if you could give the succinct answer, that would be great, because I do okay. know you've been here for quite some time. Okay. How many 
children, the data that we had was from 2015 that there were 369 children enrolled in college. What currently is the number of children in foster care who are enrolled in college? 355, I believe, is the number. And how many students, how many children in foster care are in that age group of 18 to 21? What's the total number of children who are in that number? So or the total number of children who've completed high school and are still in foster care? Yeah, so um, 355, somebody faster than me at the math um, can do this, but is uh, about 30%, right? Um, we have 30% of our okay. young people over 18, so it's what? So 30%. 2,000, what was the, I can't remember okay. what, the, what the total number is, but th mm -hmm. it's, we have about 30%, and as I mentioned nationally, um, it's typically about 20%, so we're okay. a little bit ahead of that. What, what are the demographics of the children who are in the foster care system? In the, in the overall foster care system? Yes. Yeah, okay, thank you getting notes passed. Um, so the overall demographics are, um, I have them on hand here, 53% um, African American, 32% uh, Hispanic, 5.5% uh, white, 1.6% Asian Pacific Islander, 1.9% okay. other, 6.1% unknown. And do, do these demographics pretty much follow the students who are in the CUNY program, who are in a college program? Pretty closely. Um, so the proportion of African American students in the CUNY, in the dorm program, it's about 40% African American, about 40% Hispanic, 3% Asian Pacific Islander, 10% white, and 8% other or unknown. Okay, so that's not pretty closely. If you're telling me that it's 53% who are African American and 40% in the dorm program, and if you're telling me it's 5% white totally, but 10% in the program, that's not following the demographics. These are the these are the numbers. I know they're the yeah, numbers. Yeah, yeah. I know they're the yeah, numbers. Yeah. I mean, I didn't know till now. Yes, but yeah. I hear that they are the numbers. Yeah, yeah. So my question to you yeah. then becomes, what's happening? Yeah. That more of the students who are a smaller proportion of yeah. your total population that double that number gets into these programs, whereas fifty three percent of African Americans only forty percent are in the program. What's happening? So it's a really important question. Um, the agency is, you know, very committed to tackling the issue of educational opportunity for our young people of color. Well, you're not doing a good job if we have this disparity, another problem where we see there's a mismatch. Mm -hmm. So we need to look at how that's happening. Perhaps these students are not getting uh, an equitable um, opportunity to apply or to know about the program. Yeah. It's, not, it's not a good match. So one of the things that we're, we're looking at uh, and working on as an agency, um, um, which also uh, is from council legislation and a priority um, of the commissioner, um, is looking at um, all of the work across ACS through a race and equity lens. Um, we just, as you may have heard, just um, launched a new division of child and family well-being that's headed by my colleague, um, Deputy Commissioner Lorelei Vargas, and they just had their um, national advisory board meeting and part of the work of that group, and we have a racial equity and cultural competence committee at ACS that has been working on tackling these issues, but part of the work of that group is to conduct um, the kind of assessment that you're talking about to identify where there are um, disparities and disproportionality. So did you know that there was this disparity? Because in your presentation you said we're doing pretty well. But now, you know, that, that it's being brought to the table, did you know that there was a disparity before? The questioning just now? Well, so the other issue that I don't have in front of me, which um, we need to produce, is these numbers are only for the CUNY program. Um, and so this is only for the 93 kids in CUNY. And so what I'd like to have the opportunity to do, Council Member, is to come back to you with the okay. full 
um, racial breakdowns of all 355 um, young okay. people that are in college um, because that would provide the full picture. That's good. I would hope that when we get that, it, it does have a closer match yeah. to the numbers that we have. Um, I do have a lot of questions, so I'm going to try to do them quickly. Okay. The Ken Gap program. Yeah. Is there, is it, does it require that a child presently be in foster care? I've heard parents, I've heard p persons say that they would like to directly take a child who might be uh, in need of care, but that they have to have the child placed in foster care before they can be a part of the Ken Gap program. Is that the truth? It is. is. For Ken Gap, that is correct. Now, relatives, there are other ways to assume custody of children that are outside of the foster care system. Right, but would they get the same financial support? No. So I right. think that's an issue. But I don't know how we are going to address that. But there are people who don't want to have a family member right. get placed in foster care to be able to then be able to get support, right. financial support to be able to provide for that child. Yeah, under, understood. Um, I'm actually testifying tomorrow um, uh, at the New York State Assembly hearing on supports for kinship and foster parents. And in other parts of New York State, um, there are a lot of kin who are not becoming um, kinship foster parents. Now, New York City, mm -hmm. um, we, we want to provide as much support as we possibly can um, to kinship families. And so, uh, you know, understanding that not every family wants that involvement, um, we make sure that kinship families have all the information available to them. So if they choose not to become kinship foster parents, they may be eligible for TANF and all of that. Right. Those are means tested. You know, if they if they come into um, becoming kinship foster parents, they will be eligible for a lot more resources and services. Okay. What's the percentage of children who remain in uh, foster care? You said most of them are adopted or... Um, return to their families? What percent remains? Do we have uh, that information? Well, so in a, in a given year, so we can look at the okay. F FY 2017, um, this, this chart. So in FY 2017, on the last day of the fiscal year, um, we had 809, uh, sorry, 8,966 children in care. And uh, the numbers of kids that exited care during the year, there were 2,082 that exited to reunification, 378 that exited to kinship care, and 899 that exited to adoption. Now, obviously, there's, you know, every year and every right, day, there's, right. there's kids coming in and kids right. coming out. So what's the trend that we're seeing? I know that's for one particular year. So is there... Yeah, so I mean the trend that we're seeing, which is on, you know, in this blueprint report um, on the sort of if you the, the second or third page, okay. um, you can see that the, the oh. numbers of kids in care has dropped drastically. You know, it was 50,000 in 1992. Um, even just 10 years ago, it was almost 17,000. Mm -hmm. um, and now we're down to 9,000. And you can also see that the the gap is closing between the numbers of kids in care and the numbers exiting care. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, when, when children, in your testimony, you talked about fostering college success initiative, and you said it's for students who remain in foster care while attending college. So is it a requirement that they remain in foster care mm -hmm. if some students should find other opportunities or be adopted or have some permanency, would they still qualify to be in? The dorm program you're talking about? The dorm program, right. Yeah, so the program was designed for young people in foster care, um, but we are looking at the issue that you've raised um, because if a young person is adopted, right. um, you know, then, then what will that, you know, what, what would that mean? Um, and you talked about a stipend, um, a daily stipend. Do you have the amount of that daily stipend? Yeah, it's twenty-eight dollars a day. And is that for every student, or is it only for the students who are in the dorm project? It is not just for the kids in the dorm project. Um, it's for any student um, that meets the, you know, the criteria of, you know, being in college and and um, and dorming. Um, okay. So yes. Okay. And so. 
you talked about we're going to you're looking at examining what can be done for students who might be at the point of being adopted and are in the dorm project, whether or not they could remain in that project? So um, someone just handed me a note okay. um, that the for, the for the dorm project, that the requirement is that they begin in foster care. Oh, OK. Sorry. So they can so, remain. Yeah. Yes? Okay. yes? OK. So I'm corrected. OK, good. I'm glad. That's yeah, good. That's me a good too. correction. <laughs> so in terms of then students who don't Students who don't, students who age out, or students who had been in yeah. foster care, but at some point returned home or whatever. Yeah. What kind of entitlements do they have? So, or what programs are available to them? Yeah. So, um, a couple of things. So, young people who, you know, young people at age 18, you know, they can elect to stay in care or they can elect to leave care. Okay. Um, and so sometimes young people, um, you know, uh, will elect to leave care and then, you know, might find themselves in need of support. And so we have a dedicated unit at ACS. We call it the Supervision to 21 unit, Soup 21. Um, and we have a whole unit of staff that their entire job is to reach out to young people who have elected to leave care. Mm -hmm and to check in on them, to offer services to them. And so those are young people who are not in care, but we have a unit that is you know, dedicated to, to working with them. Um, and we do have young people that will come back um, to ACS and seek our support. And of course, we're always there for that. Can they return to care, or is it just programs and support that you give to them? Young people can return to care, yes. That, okay. is, a, that is an option. OK. Um, the program that you described, First Start, at College of Staten yep. Island, yep. how were the students selected for that program? So I'll let Kathleen take that okay. question. So we provided the information to the foster care agency education specialist, and we allowed them to sort of talk to students about their interest in the program, but students self-selected. So all students were informed, um, they applied, uh, and they went through um, an interview with the First Star Academy um, and then were selected to participate. Uh, we first uh, started with a catchment area that was either students in Staten Island or students who uh, lived in Brooklyn who were fairly close to Staten Island. Um, and then we expanded it to all students in foster care because we wanted to make sure at least that students would be able to, to travel and we provide transportation for them um, but we first targeted students that were closest to the campus. Great. Uh, the, the supports that are offered, are they all on the college campus or are there other locations where these supports are provided? Is it only a summer program? So it's a year-long program. The students do meet um, during the school year. The summer program is sort of an intensive where they stay on campus for that mm -hmm. portion of the program to sort of acclimate them to a college environment so they can sort of see what a college class is like. Um, but they do meet regularly throughout the school year, and those services are, include tutoring, social-emotional supports. They um, meet as a group? As, as a, a group. group. Okay. It's a, yep. Mm -hmm. And then for, for the uh, agencies, the provider agencies that you work with, do they have uh, a limited, do they have a dedicated ratio of education, what did you call them, education specialists, we find, dedicated number? We of? find that the larger agencies have more. So for example, um, New York Foundling, who's here today, I think they have about 15 or 16 education specialists. Whereas the smaller and what's agencies, the ratio? Um, I don't have that with me right now, but we can provide that to you. Okay. And a smaller agency may have one or two, depending on how many school-aged children they have. Okay. Um, do you have partnerships with other colleges beyond CUNY? So the other large sort of um, uh, place where we see kids going is SUNY. And most kids elect to stay in New York State because of their eligibility for TAP. They don't want to lose that TAP eligibility, um, so they elect to, to go to a school within New York State. So um, SUNY is another one. We have quite a bit of kids on the Long Island campuses, as well as um, Albany, Geneseo, some, some of the colleges um, 
um, that are close to New York City, New Falls. Um, and so we've been working with SUNY uh, fairly closely as we've been working with CUNY. Um, we're talking with our New York State Office of Children and Family Services to see if we can have a similar data match, uh, the same that we have with um, CUNY with SUNY, um, as well as working with individualized offices. So for example, the higher education opportunity programs at the uh, CUNY College, uh, I'm sorry, SUNY colleges, as well as CUNY, you'll hear from today. Um, we have close relationships with those EOP offices to make sure they know who our kids are in foster care if they are selected for EOP. Um, and we talk to them on a regular basis to implement any kind of services that are uh, provided by the SUNY colleges. So for example, right now, um, the state is allowing for winter housing for students in foster care. So if they elect to stay on campus during the oh. winter session, um, so we're working with the SUNY colleges to do that. Other schools, some private um, uh, schools we may work with on an individual basis based on how many kids we have there. Um, so for example, we talk very uh, uh, frequently with LIU because we have a couple of students there. Um, NYU also, um, we have one or two students there. So depending on the population, uh, we make sure that those students understand all of the services that are available for them on campus if we don't have direct relationships with the colleges themselves. Is, is there um, a dedicated, is it the educational specialist who helps a student make application for other kinds of grants and scholarships as well? Yes, it is. And we sort of make sure that, the, that those education specialists have enough information to know what's available for all students in foster care. The ETV, most agencies are aware of that. That's a longstanding federal program. Um, but then there are certain specialized scholarships. For, so for example, right, we right. have um, for undocumented students, we know that certain colleges have specialized programs for them, which, which could include tuition support. So we make sure that the education specialists are aware of those sort of specific programs. Great. Okay, well, um, I think that covers most of the questions. You've been here quite a while, so I did want to uh, respect your time as well. I know you have another engagement, but w I would like to get those demographics that, that I asked you about, and if you could break them down by uh, age, by ethnicity, and um, uh, let me see. And any individuals who might indicate that they have a disability, if we could find that data, okay. Are there other questions from Kathy? Yeah. Um, I just have one, okay. one quick follow-up, um, or two quick follow-ups. Uh, following up on uh, Councilmember Barron's uh, last point, if we could make sure that those are for all of the various programs, not just in right. general, um, the number of youth at CUNY, but with all of the programs that have been uh, laid out uh, that you spoke of uh, to, in, to make sure that we have the demographic data for, for each program. Sure. I think that'd be helpful. Um, with, um, I just wanna make clear, uh, because I don't think the number was out there and it, looking at the strategic blueprint, we have uh, on the chart, the number of children adopted, reunified, discharged to kin gap, but we don't have the number uh, there of, of youth that, uh, that age out uh, with an APLA. Mm -hmm. Do we have a, do we ha and I know you said in your testimony that that, number, that that percentage is decreasing, but what we need, we would like to know the, the actual number yes. as well. Yes, and I have that. Um, so the number, I think, Um, so, um, in calendar year 2015, it was 799, mm -hmm. and in calendar year 2016, it dropped by 5% to 758. Okay. Um, so still then greater than the, the number of youth that are adopted and, uh, Discharge. No, I'm sorry. No. Less than the number adopted, greater than the number discharged. You can get. Correct. Yes. Um, okay. Uh, with regard to um, uh, maintaining enrollment in college, uh, that's an additional challenge. Yeah. Um, and uh, if a youth is is um, on an APLA track. Um, 
there are supports. I mean, I, I can tell you, when I was in college, I came this close to dropping out between my uh, sophomore fall semester and sophomore spring semester. I moved out. I moved out. I went home, and my dad told me, you're not, you're not dropping out of college. I said, okay. So I had to move back, uh, and I had to get a new room. Uh, Thank actually, you, they Dad. let me back into my same room, but uh, but it was that was they were very nice about that. But you know that was that was because it was because my dad when I went home that that winter, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was told you know uh, no you know, and uh, and so uh, youth that uh, that don't have a family uh, uh, to tell them that when they're when they're you know thinking oh maybe I'll you know maybe I want to go. Um, you know, work on a fishing boat in Alaska, which you know, something like that, or an oil rig in Alaska. That was, uh, that was my idea at the time. That's what I wanted to do, uh, something like that. Yeah. Um, you know, who's 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 the one intervening there, uh, and um, yeah, and what's how are we approaching that particular uh, issue of preventing uh, dropout once they're enrolled, making sure that they stay enrolled? You're reminding me of. You know, when I graduated from college and, and told my parents that I wanted to go to Breckenridge, Colorado, and you know, ski mm -hmm. for a year, right? Um, no. <laughs> and they had feelings about that. Um, so, um, I mean, what's critically important about our um, work with young people that are transitioning out of care and are not going home um, or or being adopted? is even if they're not achieving you know, what we call legal permanency, um, it is the responsibility of our foster care agencies to work with young people to identify adults in their lives who are committed to those young people. Um, you know, whether those are relatives or friends or teachers, right? And, and, and so the work is around building that, um, that circle of support um, and, and those adults who, you know, are committed to being in the young person's life. Um, and then, you know, in addition to that, I mean, for the young person who wants to drop out of, for example, the dorm program, right, um, that there are people in this room um, who are wrapped around that young person, right? Mm -hmm. And you'll hear about this um, from Bill Boccolini, um, and from the and from the CUNY team and from Malik about what happens when you know a young person is faltering you know as we, as we do um, as humans um, and um, you know in that program in particular you know the foundling staff you know is stepping in and helping and serving in the role you know that your dad did mm -hmm. um, and figuring out sort of what the you know what the issue is um, and how can we support you through this um, and so that's what we're trying to do for all young people um, um, you know because you know as you said um, all of our young people have incredible potential and you know sometimes at a moment like what you're describing you know, they need that critical adult um, who's going to push back mm -hmm. um, and, and provide counsel to help them get back on track. And so that's, again, you know, the, the responsibility of foster care agency. Okay. I, I mean, I know that you've mentioned uh, New York Foundling a number of times yeah. in, in throughout this hearing so far. And I just want to make sure that, you know, the other 26 agencies uh, yeah. have, and, and if something is working with New York Foundling, that, that, that that's part of, um, the protocol for everybody, um, because it shouldn't just be the youth that obviously are with New York Family that are getting so, that type of intervention. No, certainly not. I mean, it's the responsibility of all 27 yeah. foster care agencies mm -hmm. when a young person is, you know, faltering or doing well mm -hmm. um, for their case planner um, to be supporting them. Because there's no reason in the world at all, at all whatsoever, that a youth in college that is in the foster care system uh, should ever drop out of college. If they're in college, there's there's zero reason why uh, why they shouldn't be able to to get through uh, to a degree. I mean, I think you know clearly that's what we want, um, and that programs like this 
are designed to support our young people who do face some challenges, right? So there are sometimes young people who you know, might have a mental health crisis. And so maybe it means that they're not dropping out for good. Maybe it means that they're taking a break for a semester and then getting the support they need to come but back. That was the reason why, right. you know, my dad didn't let me drop out was because he didn't think that I was going to go back right. if I did. No, and I couldn't a, guarantee right. to him that I would. So, <laughs> right. you know, that's, uh, I just, I, I think that that, you know, however it needs to happen, yeah. that needs to happen. Right. So I'll leave it at that. Just one further question. Can we get data from you as to the number of students, the number of children who have remained in foster care uh, for a year, two, three, four, five, six, seven, without any kind of interruption, without coming out and going back in? Yeah. I still need to know, get a sense of, uh, I see the chart about the trend, but I need to get a sense of, is there a, a class of students, or a group of students who've had extensive time in foster care. Yeah, okay. there's um, length of stay data, I believe is stay. included on the flash report on our website, but we, you know, we can also look and see, um, uh, and the, oh, and it's in the MMR. So it's in the MMR, length of stay data. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, any questions? Yes, so my first of all, like, uh, I'm sorry for being late. Oh. Uh, Councilmember you know, Rodriguez, thank you. I, I didn't see you. I, my daughters and the children of, especially the professional black and Latino, will probably be in the position where you were, or my colleague, Councilmember Levine was, when he talked about dropping out from college, <laughs> because working hard, right. your parents, yeah were not or are not in the same position or the reality of those foster care teenagers that they don't have the parent, they don't have the father, or they are raised by, they were raised by a single mother. Their father is doing times in jail. So we know that that's the society where we are today in 2017. And I know that, you know, my colleague here you know, and also we're trying to be there, to be the voice of the voiceless. You need to be the voice of those youngsters that we had not created pipeline to be sure that when they go back and talk to any adult, that they get the support that they need for them to know that you, you know, graduating from college should not be something out of your plan. You know, dropout is big, and you know, CUNY is doing a great job because we, as in the city, we've been expecting for CUNY to do miracle. When you are welcoming a student, many of them that we, as a DOE, we did not prepare them. It's not that they were coming from a foster care, but it's also, unfortunately, they, many of them, they started the first semester in college, not be ready to be in college. Because they, many of them, they started taking remedial courses. And many of them, they went through community colleges. And at the community college, as you know, more than 80%, they need remedial courses in reading, writing, and math. So when we talk about that group of kids that we have, that they come from living in some type of foster care, like what percentage of them are a commu are community college? What percentage? Yes. Yes. What percentage of the universe that you have from that group go to senior colleges, and what percentage go to community college? Uh, the yes. And I'm pretty sure that the vast majority, they go through community college. Uh, well, this is I used to be a teacher for 13 years, and I know I have many of those students in my classroom, too. Yeah, this, this Can you turn your mic on, please? Thank you. Um, this doesn't exactly answer your question, but 50% um, of the students attend CUNY, 30% SUNY, 15% private schools, and 5% out of state. Now, but you're asking for the distinction between community colleges, right? So um, we can pull that information. Yeah. So again, I, I, I look at CUNY, I'm a proud of CUNY. You know, CUNY opened the door to me. Yeah. I used to be a teacher. Guiding counsel or whatever role I play, yeah. being there, working with new coming students from Latin America, 
I deal with those students that they used to live in foster care, you know, dealing with so many pressure in their life. Unfortunately, they did, they are this, but they were dispatched from high school. No, we all the support that the rest of the jumps that they have in their life. But, you know, one of my, my, I see that through the sick and, and CDU matter, you know, we talk about the students that are, uh, they are eligible, eligible to receive many programs. But what percentage of those 3,000 take advantage of all those programs? Like we have, you know, they are eligible through the youth matter to have access to a full-time social worker, MTA, MetroCard, all those services that we know that through the state funding they are eligible to, but what percentage of those youngsters really get those services? So well, we can put together that information for you. I think that's similar to what Council Member 11 was asking, essentially for sort of laying out all of these programs and the numbers of youth in, in all of the programs that we've mentioned and their demographics and all of that. So we'd be happy to put that information together. Okay. Thanks. I, I, you know, I know that we're doing the best we can, but we as a city are not in the business, has not been in the business to create a pipeline from UPK to higher education to guarantee that foster care you or not, they are college material. And then here at the Camp CUNY that we expect for you guys to say we can graduate. But when we look at the number, you know, it's not only foster care. I can tell you about City College, Hunter, Barber College. Right. Population of black and Latino been going down big time in the last 10 years. Right. And those are our senior colleges. So I know that we have friends at CUNY, but also we have to push the DOE to be sure that we prepare foster care youth or not to be able not to send them through the community colleges, but also to be sure that they go through the senior colleges. I mean, education is a absolutely critical focus for us um, at ACS, right? If, you know, the, the, taking the very serious step of removing children from their parents, you know, that's a very significant action, right, that government can take. And that if that action is, you know, sometimes necessary for, for children's safety, then we want, you know, young people in foster care um, to have the same kinds of opportunity and benefit from the same kinds of, you know, programs and services that are available to their peers, but even more so uh, because they've been removed from their parents. And, you know, we approach this work understanding that that is a, you know, a responsibility and a value um, that if young people have been removed from their parents and placed in foster care, um, you know, the, the work that we're doing to advance, you know, their well-being and their and their educational achievement is absolutely critical um, and particularly critical for young people of color um, in order for them to, you know, have a, a chance on an equitable playing field. But we also want to be the best within that, you know, I refuse to be in the, in the side chair of COVID and the side chair of the matter and the program that we have. Because I'm thinking of this and, you know, the support that we provide, 20% of students that are in classroom in class, we don't have the money to pay for 20%. Because most of the students in Puerto Rico don't have it. And they're in severe because they will not receive it. Because we lack in their service. Because we have only, we have a guidance counselor for room to see 20 students in average. They only make sure they're 20 students. And they're not serving in the room for 200 in class. And those students are too severe, you know, to be more prepared. You know, to have all the services. You know, I don't know how we go to sleep when we say, yeah, you know, again, I, I've been a co-founder to school. I've been in the classroom as long as I've been at the council, and being a teacher as long as I've been at the council. Right. And it breaks my heart that we know that foster care students, they are not supporting the high school as they should. To be sure that we celebrate, because you know what happened? If one of the top students from foster care, they will make it to a good college, we will take photo with them. 
teachers, elected officials, parents, program directors. Because we know that we are not making those numbers, then we don't have those data to share with us. So it's more, you know, like it's tough for those kids to stay in college and graduate. And unless we have a better program, a better pipeline, we will come back going hearing to hearing, mentioning certain programs, but without, without being able to share the data saying 80% of those kids graduate from college. 50% of them, they went through senior colleges. And that happened because we provide all the support that they needed. So that's what this conversation is so critical to that, right? I mean, we are tracking outcomes. Um, you know, the foundling is tracking outcomes. ACS is tracking outcomes. CUNY is tracking outcomes. Um, and I think what's so important and what's really been recognized, I think, by everybody in their comments today is that for young people in foster care to succeed in particular in high school and in college requires something extra, and it requires you know, the kinds of programs that we're, we're talking about and scaling those programs so we can make sure that every young person in elementary school, middle school, high school, and college has the kinds of extra wraparound supports to succeed. Thank you. Uh, if there are no further questions, we want to thank the panel for coming and doing thank your you. presentation. Thank you. I understand you do have to leave, but we expect that someone will be here to gather the other questions that might come up. Yes, we have a, a whole team of folks great. who are here. And thank you so much. I can much. stay a little bit longer. Oh, but. great, thank you. <laughs> and so now we're gonna call the next panel. Next panel, Donna Linderman, University Dean for Student Success Initiatives at CUNY. Shirley DePena, University Director, Youth Matters at CUNY. Jasmine Edwards, um, student at John Jay College. I'm going to have my council um, administer the oath. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council members' questions? I do. Please state your name for the records. Donna Linderman, University Dean Student Success Initiatives at the City University of New York. Good afternoon, members of the City Council, Higher Education, and General Welfare Committees. I am Donna Linderman, CUNY University Dean for Student Success Initiatives. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you about the various ways CUNY is supporting foster care youth in their higher education pursuits. I am joined by Shirley DePena, University Director for Youth Matter, a structured support <coughs> system to, um, for foster care youth who are currently or formerly in care in our Seek CD programs and Jasmine Edwards, a Sikh Youth Matter student attending John Jay College of Criminal Justice. Together, we will aim to describe the multifaceted strategies CUNY has established in dialogue with our partners uh, to ensure more New York City foster care youth have the support they need to move towards completion of a college degree. Currently, there are several initiatives that provide pipelines into and through CUNY degree programs that reflect the university's deep commitment to ensuring uh, that more transition age foster care youth have significant support to uh, earn a college degree. I will provide an overview of the CUNY ACS Fostering College Success Initiatives, FCSI, a year-round residential support program for youth in care through a partnership between CUNY, um, ACS, and New York Foundling. Ms. DePena will describe our, uh, as well as our FCI program supported by the Foster, uh, by the Hilton Foundation. Ms. DePena will describe Seek CD Youth Matter, 
which is supported by the State of New York and our Office of Student Affairs Foster Care Collaborative, which convenes CUNY city and nonprofit foster care stakeholders to discuss best practices and common issues supporting youth in care in higher education. And finally, Ms. Edwards uh, will speak about her experience as a Sikh Youth Matter student and dorming student at Queens College. Many foster care youth um, have had life experiences that may have affected their K-12 educational opportunity experiences and impact their college growing rates. Nationally, only 10% of transition age foster care youth go to college and only 3% go on to earn a college degree. In New York City, based on data from a report by the Community Service Society of New York, it is estimated that no more than 24% of college aged foster care youth are enrolled in college compared to 60% of students statewide. And while a college degree was recognized as an essential credential for long-term economic success, few young people who have been in foster care enroll and graduate from college. CUNY, in dialogue with our public and private partners, uh, have combined forces uh, to create evidence-based research and proven successful best practices to shape initiatives that aim to improve those statistics. Uh, these initiatives represent the university's best efforts uh, to expand access to a wide range of potential students from diverse backgrounds, uh, strengthen partnerships, ensure smooth transition of non-traditional college students, and bolster student support structures that will raise academic success rates. So one of the most critical needs of transition age foster care youth attending college is stable year-round housing. Launched in 2016 with support from the City of New York, the Fostering College Success Initiatives aims to address this critical need by providing a college residential support program for youth in care through a partnership between CUNY, ACS, and New York Foundling. FCSI students may reside in one of three CUNY residence um, halls, Queens College, College of Staten Island, or City College. Students who reside at Queens and City may attend any CUNY undergraduate college. Students who dorm at CSI attend CSI. Students receive 12 months of year-round room and board and financial support to cover their full cost of CUNY attendance, including textbook and transportation stipends and waiver of any tuition and fee gaps um, after application of financial aid. Students also receive a mi monthly stipend, which you heard about from the Deputy Commissioner directly from ACS for personal expenses. Acknowledging that youth in foster care may need additional supports to be successful in college, FCSI students also receive wraparound services, including tutoring, mentoring, and counseling within the dormitory setting through New York Foundling. FCSI students are also strongly encouraged to enroll in CUNY programs that provide financial resources, structured degree pathways, advisement and academic support, such as ASAP, SEEK, and College Discovery. This year, FCSI admitted 93 students, of which 37 are enrolled in ASAP, 10 in SEEK, and 13 in College Discovery. Demographics of current FCSI students are as follows, 40% Hispanic, 39% Black, 3% Asian Pacific Islander, 10% White, and 8% Other or Unknown. By gender, 44% are male and 56% female with a mean age of 20. And we are grateful to ACS and New York Foundling, um, our partners, and deeply appreciate the generous support from the city to launch FCSI. This is a unique and important project that considers the comprehensive needs of youth in care uh, while pursuing their college degrees at CUNY. In 2015, CUNY Start received a four-year grant in the amount of $2.5 million from the Conrad and Hilton Foundation to create a supportive pipeline program for 325 transition age youth from foster care to move seamlessly through CUNY Start and ASAP, um, which led to the creation of the CUNY Start ASAP Foster Care Initiative. Sorry for all the acronyms, FCI, FCI, FCSI. So FCI serves students uh, age 17 to 21 with active ACS foster care status who wish to pursue a, an associate degree at CUNY and are eligible for CUNY Start and or ASAP. CUNY Start and ASAP are two of CUNY's most successful and nationally recognized programs that have achieved remarkable results in assisting students to address deep remedial needs before matriculation in the case of CUNY Start, and earn an associate degree in a timely manner in the case of ASAP. ASAP offers a structured degree pathway that provides financial resources to remove barriers to full-time study and comprehensive student support services that assist students in earning an associate degree within three years. We provide a range of financial, academic, and personal supports, 
including comprehensive and personalized advisement, career counseling, tutoring, and waivers for tuition and mandatory fees, MTA metro cards, and the cost of textbooks. The program realizes more than double the three-year graduation rates of similar students, 53% for ASAP versus 24% for matched comparison group students, and is currently undergoing a major expansion to 25,000 students in the coming year, thanks to the generous support of the city. CUNY START, which is a sister program of ASAP, provides intensive instruction and advisement for incoming CUNY associate students with significant remedial needs in reading, writing, and or math. CUNY START helps students prepare for college level coursework, reduce or eliminate any remedial needs prior to matriculation, foster high levels of persistence, and increase the likelihood of graduation. While CUNY START serves students with significant remedial needs, nearly 70% of our students enter with needs in reading, writing, and math. At program completion, more than half of our full-time students exit fully proficient, and remaining students have significantly reduced their remedial needs, all before matriculation. This year, we were also pleased to extend FCI to students who joined John Jay's uh, Accelerate, Complete, and Engage program, which is a baccalaureate pilot program modeled on ASAP that expanded in 2017 with support from the Mayor's Office uh, for Economic Opportunity. FCI aims to improve the rates of enrollment, retention, and persistence for these students, ensuring that at least 85% of students enrolled in CUNY START complete the program, and that at least 80% then move on or uh, transition to ASAP. For those that persist in ASAP, our goal is to see at least 50% graduate within three years. FCI has established strong strategic partnerships with New York City foster care agencies in order to develop a recruitment and referral pathway that seeks to increase the number of foster care students who enroll at CUNY. To date, we've partnered with over 20 agencies and ACS and developed on, an online referral tool um, to allow for easy referral to the program. Um, FCI provides an additional layer of support beyond the benefits students already receive through CUNY START, um, our eight-week Math Start program, and ASAP. Additional FCI services and resources include assistance with the CUNY admissions and financial aid process, college navigation supports, um, fee waivers for the CUNY application and CUNY Start and Math Start fees, unlimited Metro cards during the CUNY Start and Math Start phase, additional free winter and summer courses, paid on-campus internships, and student engagement activities, and special events, and of course referrals to our Fostering College Success Dorming Opportunity. Uh, two CUNY-wide FCI coordinators work with campus-based staff to support students through the admissions and intake process. Once enrolled at CUNY, FCI uh, team members uh, provide those additional layers of support to stu ensure that students are able to persist in addition to support provided by CUNY Start and ASAP. And of course, the dorm service is provided by New York Foundling. FCI currently serves 116 students across 10 colleges that offer ASAP and ACE and CUNY Start and Math Start, and we plan to enroll another 60 students in spring 2018. Uh, next year, we hope to enroll another 100 students. FCI demographics are as follows, 67% are female, 32% male, 48% are black, 43% Hispanic, and 9% Asian, um, other and unknown students. I can say that of students who enter uh, in FCI, we've done some uh, analysis of high school mobility uh, for those that attended high school in New York City, and we found that almost 80% of students moved uh, to a different zip code at least once during high school, um, and half of students moved two or more times. Additionally, 57% transferred to a different high school at least once during their, their DOE uh, career. Our Office of Research Evaluation and Program Support is leading an evaluation of um, CUNY START ASAP Foster Care Initiative, and this evaluation supports program development and we hope contributes to the larger discussion on foster care youth in higher education. So REPS is conducting a longitudinal study, uh, drawing on multiple data sources to assess how FCI program supports affects the post-secondary outcomes for students in care. This includes designing um, an original, original survey instruments um, and developing an online platform for data collection and program management. REPS is also facilitating uh, three two-year research fellowships for CUNY faculty, conducting independent research on college access and success of youth in care. And findings from this work will be uh, presented at a symposium in spring 2019 when the analysis is done. And finally, we have a memorandum of understanding with ACS, uh, between ACS and CUNY, uh, to allow for data exchange that was mentioned previously. 
So in closing, I will just say supporting the needs of transition age youth in care at CUNY is a top priority for the university, uh, for campus leadership um, and university leadership, and a, and a reflection of our mission to help New Yorkers of all backgrounds realize their educational goals and full potential. We are grateful to our public and private partners, ACS, New York Foundling, New Yorkers for Children, all of the foster care agencies across the city, um, our college leadership and staff uh, to support the various programs um, to meet students' needs. And we reiterate our commitment to working strategically to ensure that foster care youth know that they have a home and a network behind them at CUNY at every step of their college journey. We'd like to thank the council for your interest and your generous support of these efforts. Good afternoon, members of the City Council's General Welfare and Higher Education Committees. My name is Shirley De Peña. I am the University Director for Youth Matter, a structured support system for our Sikh and College Discovery students at CUNY. I appreciate the opportunity to, to provide testimony at today's joint public hearing, focusing on higher education opportunities for youth aging out of foster care. As we've discussed today, young people that have been involved with the child welfare system do face significant challenges because of their experiences. Some of these burdens include physical and psychological trauma, lack of financial support that includes food and housing insecurity, academic challenges, lack of preparation, and a culture of low expectations. With respect to opportunities in higher education, foster youth are among the most disadvantaged. For many, higher education can be a ticket to a better life. Unfortunately, many foster youth face unique and significant barriers in higher education. Studies suggest that college students who have been in foster care continue to lag behind their peers with respect to college retention and graduation, even when compared to low-income first-generation students. Foster youth who attend college may face additional hurdles once they get there. One such hurdle is the cost of living. Youth in foster care cannot succeed <coughs> academically if they have basic unmet school-related needs. Furthermore, many studies suggest that the most pervasive challenge is a lack of supportive relationships with adults in and out of school. Seek and College Discovery are the opportunity programs at CUNY, and they were established about 50 years ago to provide comprehensive <laughs> academic support to assist capable students who otherwise might not be able to attend college due to their educational and financial circumstances. As you may be aware, Seek and College Discovery provide financial assistance to students by way of book stipends and fee waivers and extra semesters of financial aid to get them through college. They also provide intensive academic support in terms of tutoring. Our tutoring support is preventive. We believe that students should start tutoring at the onset of their college career. Um, and students in Seek and College Discovery also have personalized counseling by their own advisor where they are able to go to their advisor to both talk about academic needs and socio-emotional needs. In 2015, New York State invested $1.5 million into the 2015-2016 budget for the Foster Youth College Success Initiative, FYCSI, a program designed to help foster youth in the opportunity programs at CUNY, SUNY, and private colleges successfully complete college. On April 1st, 2016, New York State doubled that number, investing $3 million for 2016-2017 and rose to $4.5 million for the 2017-2018 academic year. Branded Youth Matter at CUNY, the Foster Youth College Success Initiative seeks to implement a structured support system to help foster youth in CUNY seek and college discovery programs by providing access to academic, social, financial, and psychosocial support above and beyond the support they receive from Seek and College Discovery. In its first year of program operation, which was in 2015, Youth Matter identified approximately 60 Seek and College Discovery students for participation in the program and began providing services. Currently, Youth Matter serves 103 Seek and College Discovery students across 17 campuses that are a part of this subpopulation. Um, just to give some demographics as well, of the 103 students currently, 60% of 62% of our students are females, 38% of our students are males, 30% uh, are Hispanic Latino, 2% are Asian, 56% are Black African American, 7% are white, and 5% are unknown. 
Most of our students are between the ages of 18 and 25. 44%, 46% are between the ages of 18 and 21, and 48% are between the ages of 22 to 25. Youth Matter provides uh, support to students who are currently in foster care, were previously in foster care, at least at the age of 13, orphans and wards of the court. We also have 58% of our students at senior colleges with 42% at community colleges. Students in the program receive monthly Metro cards, campus meal vouchers, housing assistance in CUNY's residential dorms, and winter and summer tuition assistance each semester if needed. Students in the Youth Matter program are also connected to life coaches who will work individually with students on their personal, professional, and career development goals. Additionally, as a licensed clinical social worker, I also meet with students regularly in small groups and individual meetings to help them navigate the system of higher education and ensure they're receiving the appropriate support they need to be successful in college and in life. The CUNY Foster Care Collaborative is another key foster care initiative at CUNY. The collaborative holds regular convenings of CUNY key staff and foster care agencies and advocates from and advocates from across the city to discuss ways to improve the college transition and success of foster care youth at CUNY. The collaborative has also created a one-stop website detailing a range of CUNY resources, program, services, and supports available to students here in care at CUNY. In closing, I'd like to take the time to thank the councils for your support and collaborative efforts as we've worked to provide access and promote success in higher education for our young adults aging out of the foster care system. I appreciate the opportunity to discuss CUNY's efforts, as well as the efforts of the SEEK College Discovery and Youth Matter staff to provide much needed support to these young adults. I am happy to take your questions. Thank you, next panelist. Hi. Sorry. Hi. Um, thank you for listening to me. My name is Jasmine Edwards, and I'm currently a senior at John Jay College for Criminal Justice. Um, before I start, I would like to say that I'm, I got my associates in criminal law enforcement at SUNY Farmingdale. Um, transferring into John Jay was smooth, especially for Youth Matters, because they told me in my SUNY school that if you come in through an opportunity program, that it follows you to a CUNY or a private, and that was called SEEK, I knew it as EOP. Um, when I transferred into John Jay, they didn't have me as a SEEK student, but then when I met with Shirley DePena at the dorm project, she was with, UMAT, she was with Youth Matters, and she got me on track to be in, um, not in track, because I was supposed to be in it, but <laughs> she helped me. <laughs> um, she corrected the school's mistake and made sure that I was gonna have all the resources that I needed. Um, but to continue, um, coming to CUNY was a really good decision that I made. Um, simply because of the opportunities that I was missing out going to a SUNY school. Um, at first I assumed that going to a SUNY school would mean more opportunities because I'm leaving my comfort zone. I thought that I would grow more, but then I realized that going away kind of hindered me. There was a lot of opportunities that I wanted that I couldn't have because it, it wasn't made available to me being away. Um, coming to John Jay, um, sorry. Um, so I'm in the SEEK program and I major in criminal management and I graduate in the spring. Um, being in the SEEK program has helped the transition simply because I'm in care and a lot of the problems that I've noticed, I was gonna read this, but I feel differently. I feel this right, but I feel this. Um, Take your time, present it whatever way you want. You, for the you can ad lib, you can um. read, you can do a combination, <laughs> um, whatever's comfortable for you. No um, I noticed. Um, I noticed that this is my my senior year. That um, I, I didn't realize it would be the most hardest year for me. Mm -hmm. Yes, because I'm graduating, but more so because you're recognizing like who you are in society at this point, and you're starting to realize how much support you're going to need. I was one of the students in youth and care who didn't need anything extra just I needed a roof over my head and some food and that was really it. I wasn't looking for extra anything. So I managed to get through college without really 
asking for so much. It was a lot of like my agency, JCCA, telling me like, hey, Jasmine, we're supposed to do that for you. You should have asked us. You shouldn't do it on your own. But I was just so used to being independent because of the situation that I'm in. Um, in my senior year, I realized, and I, you guys mentioned it earlier, that um, you kind of can't take that break that you might need because you feel like you're in care and you have all of these opportunities awarded to you and you don't really have that time to like breathe and be a human being. It's kind of like you're not so much a person, you're a youth in care. When someone sees you, you're like, you're that youth in care. You kind of like lose who you are and you don't want them to forget that you're still someone who has basic needs, who's in care, who's not. But definitely being in seek allowed for me to get the extra support and in youth matters because I'm sure they didn't know. Um, whenever I need a shoulder to cry on, because I'm not a crier, but I've cried a lot this semester <laughs> in her office. Like I was, I'm just like really used to letting like my my private life not get in the way of school. I was trying to keep them bright, like uh, separated. But it wasn't until this year that I realized that they definitely, I I, I can't keep it separated anymore. I could cry. Oh my God, is that, is this water? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Take your time. Just need some water. We're so pleased that you decided that you would be a part of this panel to bring us the reality of what it is that uh, those who are in foster care face. So take your time. Your testimony is very um, important. Um, well, speaking on that, um, Thank you. <laughs> Speaking on that, um, I'm a part of a lot of the um, organizations that was mentioned by ACS, like the Dorm Project with Foundling, my agency, Youth Matters. And I'm extremely grateful for these opportunities because when I decided to come to John Jay, those were like in the works. It wasn't, it wasn't like, it wasn't a thing. So when I came back to the city, my idea was I'm going to go back into my foster home and I'm going to get my degree and that's it which was really kind of depressing because I had spent three years away growing further and to have to return back to a foster home was, I mean, I love my foster mom, but I didn't want to do that. I just felt like I was growing this way and going home and knowing that I wouldn't be able to stay there too. It was, it was kind of confusing, but then the dorm project came about. So me living there allowed me to like continue to grow. And that's where I met Shirley too. So I I feel like it's more than just because like a lot of it is like money, you know. I'm I'm in I'm in, I'm in John Jay. I'm a criminal management student. A lot of it is they tell us it's, it's politics, politics, and I feel like it needs to be less about how much it costs. Like there's a bunch of different discussions that we have where everything's about how much it, does it cost, and not so much about the. Like, what, what matters most to me is, like, how the person is feeling. And, yeah, we're receiving money and Metro cards and this and that and books are paid for in school. But the one thing that I've constantly repeated this, this year, because, like I said, it was really hard, was having someone there to talk to. Because it's, it's kind of like you can have support someone throwing money in your face. And then you realize how much money really isn't important because yeah you're getting a stipend but then having someone that you know you can talk to down to Shirley at Youth Matters or my counselor at SEEK or even my CSCs at the Foundling at the um, the dorm project a lot of it that I needed this semester was someone to talk to especially because in my agency I'm seen as one of like the strongest like the, the stronger students who are gonna push through but then sometimes it, it sucks being the person who's gonna get through because I, I feel like we, we tend to focus more on the students who need obvious help, who look like they're failing or who looks like they have these things wrong with them. And people tend to forget to ask about the people who appeared. I'm sorry. Sorry. Okay, I'm so sorry. No um, need to apologize. I feel like we tend to forget about the, the strong students because we assume that like they'll be good because they're driven and like they're gonna work hard regardless. But as I keep saying, like my senior year was the hardest and I feel like these kind of programs will be good for youth coming behind me, which is why in my old school in Farmingdale, my original plan was to go to law school. 
and I took a class called juvenile delinquency and we had like a mock trial and I was a lawyer and the question I kept asking was, well, where was the program set in place for this kid? Why am I defending this person? Because we, we took it serious. I'm like, why is, mm -hmm. like, where's the programs in place? Why am I defending this kid now? Like, why is, like, I felt guilt because I lost that case. <laughs> 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 and I felt like it wasn't that I lost the case. I just felt like we failed the kid in general because I'm just like, why are we waiting till they're in a courtroom to try to help this kid right. either go into the system or not? That there needs to be programs in place that will, um, that will they won't even get to this part in, in their life. And I was like, well, how about you do it, Jasmine? Like instead of asking where was the program, step back and be like at the root of the, 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 the flower and help plan those. And that's when I decided that I wanted to be an advocate for youth and care because I, I really, really care. And I feel like because I'm a youth and care, I understand firsthand what it feels like and I feel like sometimes I mean I can't dance, can't sing, I can't draw, but I have a voice and I feel like once I'm graduated and I'm adult, you know, and I have my kids, I'm never gonna forget all of the supportive people that was around me, Youth Matters, Seek, the Foundling, my agency, and I wanna be one of those people where a kid is, you know, I'm off for the weekend, but the kid is waiting for Monday to come. Like, I gotta speak to Miss Edwards because she's, you know, she's there to help. And it's just, I feel like that's far more rewarding. And that's how I wanna wrap things up. Um, just saying thank you to everyone. And I know it's not perfect, but that's why I'm here. And when I graduate next semester, I will be joining everyone in helping assist youth in care because it really matters to me. Thank you. happy to take any questions. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much uh, to the panel for coming and for sharing. And uh, I just have a few questions and then I'll turn it to my colleague. Um, so you've decided uh, that, let's see, um, Ms. Edwards, that you want to be an advocate now for yes. youth and care. Yes. And I'm sure that uh, being in this situation, you've got some insights that others who are just as committed don't have because they haven't been through those kinds of experiences. And it's interesting to hear you say that it's um, the child who has the obvious kinds of perhaps signals of needing help that will get attention, but perhaps those who don't have those kinds of obvious needs or is seen as a person who's the high achieving person doesn't get uh, perhaps the need, the assistance and the need and the interaction seem to be not just about the program elements, but the personal connection, the support, the mentoring, the counseling that was so important. And, and as a member of the uh, council talking about higher education, we always say that that's so important. It's the supports that come in terms of the social interactions and the social dynamics that make a big difference. So we're so pleased that uh, you're going to enter into that field and we look forward to your coming and being in the field and adding your voice to what it is that we know is going to be needed. Um, to Ms. DePena, I just wanted to know if you could once again give me those demographics. Yes. I didn't see them. I'm sorry, I can I can share those with you. Okay, well. if you could just Absolutely. rattle them off again. I, sure. I can make a note. All of them? And then, yes. The, okay. Yeah. So we currently have 62% females and 38% males in the program this year. And you're talking about which particular program? The Youth Matter program. Youth Matters. So those oh. are the Seek and College Discovery students who are either in, currently in foster care, were previously in foster care, at least at the age of 13, orphans and wards of the court. Okay. Of those uh, students, 30% are Hispanic Latino. 2% are Asian, 56% are black and African American, 7% are white, and 5% are unknown. 46% of our students are between the ages of 18 and 21. 48% are between the ages of 22 and 25, and 7% are 25 and over, older. We also have the demographics for senior colleges versus community colleges, and I'm, you know, uh, Councilmember Rodriguez left, but he was asked that question specifically. 
58% of our students are at senior colleges and 42% are at community colleges. I also have the breakdowns of race and ethnicity by male and female if you want that as well. Okay, if you could send those out. I can. That, that would be wonderful. Absolutely. So, so this more closely aligns with what was presented earlier in terms of uh, children who are in care. This more closely aligns to so. that. Right. So these are the Youth Matters children who are in the SEEK program and yes. College Discovery. Yes. Okay, good. Um, I'm going to, I just want to commend CUNY doing a great job. I think the programs that, that you've talked about are so important. Now, you said the FCI program began with a grant in 2015 of $2.5 million. It's a four-year grant. What's going to happen at the end of the fourth year? So the idea was really to, to think about building a supportive pipeline that that the programs themselves could continue. So the idea of building uh, relationships with agency uh, partners across the city um, to you know, make a more explicit and uh, clear pathway into CUNY Start and ASAP, the idea is that we will, CUNY, will adopt this and make this just part of how we recruit for CUNY Start and ASAP. Um, and the kind of emergence of the dorm project, as, as the deputy commissioner calls it, we all call it that, actually, um, was a very happy intervention because that s literally was the single most important thing mm -hmm. that students we were initially recruiting for FCI, the Hilton grant did not have money in it for housing. So mm -hmm. that, was, that was kind of the missing link. But in terms of the work we're doing in FCI, our goal is to just integrate the recruitment and outreach uh, practices we've, uh, we've adopted um, ourselves. So as the budget cycle begins in a couple of weeks, what is CUNY planning to ask for to expand this project so that we will have a greater opportunity for youth in foster care to be able to have a place where they can uh, operate from? And it, again, it talks to helping to develop, develop their independence. Yes. So what does CUNY have a plan for that? Or? So, I, we, I mean, it is certainly CUNY's goal. We, we really want to build on, the, on this dorm project because it is clearly such a critical piece. Um, I mean, you heard Jasmine say she needs a roof over her head yep. and food to eat, and those are things you can't magically make appear in the city of New York. So that's certainly, ex continuing to expand that program will certainly be part of the ask. I can't give you an exact figure right right now at this moment. We're right. still in dialogue. Part of it is also looking at the capacity of the, of the dorms to make sure we can we can welcome more students in. Right. Uh, so in terms of housing, um, I understand the dorm and the ability to be able to have that support right there and built in. Um, do you see the opportunity to have housing outside of dorms, or what do you think might be the problems that might be inherent in that? So. Um, this isn't my area of CUNY, but I, okay. I know at the very beginning when, when, when uh, the dorm project sort of materialized, there was dialogue between ACS, Foundling, and CUNY about perhaps we could look to see if there could be an external resident hall. That, that is not such an easy thing to do in New York, uh, creating, first of all, finding a space that is a dormitory or could become one, and then ensuring that it, it meets all the specifications for a safe stable uh, location. So that that was actually part of the original explorations. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at Bill because he was critical in, in saying we need something like this. It, it was complicated. Again, this isn't my area mm -hmm. at CUNY. So the, uh, the opportunity of plugging into available resident um, opportunities within CUNY made more sense. As you're of aware, uh, Chairperson Barron, CUNY is not first and foremost a residential. Right. Uh, we don't have a lot of dorms. Right. So uh, CUNY is interested in expanding um, that capacity, but I don't want to speak on behalf of uh, Vice Chancellor Bergstrom or others who are more expert on where we're at with that uh, right now. Well, the mayor, I think yesterday or the day before, announced uh, some thoughts about housing, that the city would secure housing to address the homeless population. Mm -hmm. So while the mayor is talking about that, we can talk to the mayor and I, I add, completely have, agree. add this on to that. For, from, your, from your lips to, to, to God's ears, but okay. that, that's, a, that's wonderful. Also, I just you know, wanted to reiterate that as, as ASAP expands and, and our maths, CUNY Start Math Start programs expand, 
we, we really want to make sure that those opportunities are explicit, clear, and easy to access for all New Yorkers, but particularly for the most vulnerable students that we're talking about today. So that's why we take that recruitment and partnership development very, very seriously. So you said that the initial grant did not include housing. So what is CUNY's budget now to serve the students uh, in ACS foster care through the program, through the housing? Mm -hmm. So our, our budget for FCSI for the housing, it's $3.2 million. Um, and that supports uh, 93 students um, uh, year round after the application of financial aid and any benefits that may accrue in a program like Seeker CD or an ASAP. Um, that budget waives any other costs for their year round housing, dorms, transportation, textbooks, anything that's not provided to, to meet their full cost of attendance needs. So that's, that's what the $3.2 million is intended to cover. Small piece of it covers some um, administration support for the program, but the vast majority of it, almost all of it goes directly to student needs. And does that include the stipend? And what is the stipend? Is that the same stipend as the dorm project? Or is it so, so the stipend is handled by ACS. That is, that okay, is so, that's so the $28 per day okay. that you heard about from the deputy commissioner, mm -hmm. that comes directly from ACS to the students. Mm -hmm. And okay. I can add that for the Youth Matter program, our current budget is uh, $4.5 million um, for the 17-18 uh, year, and CUNY has 28% of that budget, um, and the rest is uh, CUNY, I'm sorry, SUNY and um, HEOP. And we provide to our students, we do have um, housing assistance for our students. So we have a number of students that are currently in CUNY residential dorms that are not a part of the dorm project that the mm -hmm. Youth Matter program fully pays for. Okay, great. Um, and then just before I pass it to my colleague, you know, everything is relative. Uh, the ACS panel before, I believe, said that uh, there was 30% of the students in foster care who were in the programs, and this exceeds the national rate. And as I read your testimony, we're far below New York State's rate. So, you know, it depends on who you're comparing yourself to. Absolutely. So if we're comparing ourselves to rural America and other areas, um, that's one fact, one matter. But to look at New York State, which I think is a more equitable person to get, a more equitable entity to gauge ourselves by, we're not doing well, not at all. We have a long okay. way to go. Okay, and for, um, you said, uh, new, based on data from a report by the CSS, it's estimated that no more than 24% of the college-age foster, college age foster youth are enrolled in college, compared to 60% of students statewide. So what is the source of that data? Um, so I, I don't work for the Community Service Society. Um, they, I believe they pulled that from um, uh, um, iPads data, data from CUNY. Um, and so I, I could get we'll that to, to you. I, I would appreciate it, yes. I could certainly get that to you. Yes, good. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Council <coughs> yes, sorry. I just want to add real fast, because I meant to say it after, that um, I feel like people don't realize what like SEEK is or any of the opportunity programs. It's literally getting high school students who, who the college said you won't do well in our school. They're basically saying they're going to do well in the school and we're going to support them. My grades, they weren't that low, but schools wanted a certain uh, GPA. And based off what my GPA was in high school, the colleges said, no, you're not going to do well. But then I got in through, I guess, SEEK or Opportunity mm -hmm. Program, mm -hmm. and I'm actually doing far better than the students that they said were going to do well. <laughs> so <laughs> I have... I have a 3.572 GPA. I'm on two honor societies. I just got in. I'm sorry. Just last Thursday, I got um, and I got inducted into Chi Alpha Epsilon. That's Seek's honor society. And January 11th, I will be in Al Alpha Sigma. That's a leadership society. So I just want to mention, like, I wouldn't. I literally would not be where I am today mm -hmm. if it weren't for programs like Seek, because. I, I don't know whose idea it was <laughs> to say like, oh, there's a like, there's a demographic of students who, yeah, their grades show this and they may not be able to pay for it, but with assistance, I'm sure that they will. 
And I feel like that's a problem too, kind of like sectioning off high schoolers. Like I'm mm-hmm. sure no one in here was the same way they were in high school that they were at the end of college. Mm-hmm. So I just want to mention the like the actual importance of what seek is to seek students who aren't in care because there are students who aren't yes. in care who have the same issues that I have that seek has met. So right. that's what I want to say. Well, it was it was a collective of black legislators who were in Albany in the, I guess it was the 1970s, early 1970s, who had that understanding that GPAs are not 100% indicators of how successful people will be in a college level. So it was they who, it was that group of black legislators in assembly who said, no, you've got to make some uh, provisions and some allowances here that will allow us to bring in students and give them support And we'll be able to demonstrate that, yes, they are um, college material. They just didn't perhaps have the the opportunity in high schools or the support or the exposure to show what their capabilities were. So you're a great example for that. Uh, Council Member Levin. Thank you very much, Chair Barron. Um, I want to thank this panel. Uh, Ms. Edwards, thank you so much for your testimony and, um, you know, very important that you are here um, to tell your story um, for the record, so that um, so that as we're, you know, as we as a, overall between CUNY and the City Council, the administration, um, ACS are looking at how to make the programs more effective and reach more youth in care. Um, that you know you are providing, you know, uh, a clear uh, guidance as to what has worked, what needs improvement. Um, but uh, but also just to share your story is is, uh, um, is brave to do that and uh, and and and, uh, and very impactful. So I want to thank you very much. Um, to uh, uh, to this panel, I just have a, a quick question about beyond college. Um, what type of support um, do these programs supply? Uh, to these young people once they graduated because um, uh, as we all know and I could go back and tell my story about after I graduated (laughs) and the type of support that I needed (laughs) sure yeah I mean I had to you know I I tried for six months and then and then I had to move back in with my parents because I couldn't I couldn't uh, I wasn't making enough money to keep my apartment and um, you know and I didn't really have anywhere else to go and so I needed that place I needed that that six months back home to be able to get you know, be able to find a job. Uh, it took it took a long time to find a job. This was, um, uh, you know, and I think it's probably e- even harder now. Um, and uh, and so having having that support um, is is necessary, you know, in an ongoing way. Um, and uh, making sure that uh, young people are really able to get their uh, feet under them. Um, is uh, is essential for everybody. So, can you explain a little bit about what uh, what CUNY and uh, and all of these programs with ACS are sure, doing? Sure, sure. So I'll speak. Graduation? Yeah. So I'll speak a little bit about about what we do. Um, so CUNY Start helps students matriculate into um, a degree program. Um, most of the students go into ASAP, but students can also enter CD or or C, or Seek or or none of those programs. Just be a matriculated student. Um, in ASAP, we have embedded career and employment services within the program um, that include um, opportunities for students to create a career plan as well as a further education plan. Um, so that includes a range of, of activities, including creating cover letters uh, and, a, and a resume, making a plan for the um, for understanding what it takes to enter into particular professions. Are you going to need to move on to a bachelor's degree? The answer is almost always yes. Are you going to need to plan to go on for a graduate graduate degree or professional degree? Uh, frequently it does. Um, and then very importantly, we try to connect students with experiential and ideally paid internship opportunities while they're in the program to start to get some, some grounding um, in the profession they hope to move into. And then the combination of the student's personalized advise, advisement support and career support helps the students make the transition when they're leaving the program. The majority of students that graduate from ASAP, 85%, um, do transfer to to a senior college and pursue baccalaureate work, um, and 
our long-term data shows that it's sort of the gift that keeps on giving because the students have a high, higher rates of transfer, higher rates of baccalaureate completion, and they complete their degrees faster. Um, if I could just for a moment mention what CUNY is doing outside of, of any of the programs, you're going to hear about CUNY is really re-envisioning re uh, kind of workforce and career readiness um, as part of our strategic plan, Connected CUNY, which you might have heard about. Um, and it's really about thinking um, how you put every student, regardless of being in a special program, on the path to understand what their career options are um, and what you need to do to get ready to take steps towards your career of choice. Not just going to a couple of workshops, but really making a plan to get um, a purposeful paid internship as you're moving through your college career. So it is the university's goal that all students are going to have um, an experiential paid opportunity before they leave CUNY and a more strategic plan to be put on the path towards a career and to really build out um, our relationships with both public and private employers. So this is an enormous piece of the Connected CUNY, one of the three core student-facing pillars of our Connected CUNY plan. I'm speaking about work that is aspirational and future-facing, um, but it's a pretty robust plan. And if you, you have interest in, in hearing about some of that work, I would be very pleased uh, to send some information from my colleague, uh, Dean Angie Kamath, who's in charge of career and workforce. So that's kind of a broader university focus, but Shirley, I'm sure, um, could talk about what they're doing in Seek CD specifically as well. I think similarly, um, the counseling that our students receive from the moment that they enter CUNY, um, whether it's through Seek and College Discovery, many of our students also transfer from College Discovery and their associate programs when they graduate and they come into our senior colleges um, <clears throat> as Seek students. Our, per, our counselors work with students from the onset in terms of finding, uh, talking about career plans, helping them with resumes. We do a lot of um, prep work and resume writing workshops and interviewing and techniques to help students uh, as they are looking for internships. A lot of internship opportunities come our way. Uh, Jasmine actually, actually currently is working one of her part-time jobs through an opportunity that came through the, the SEEK program and the Youth Matter program, and she was able to success, actually both of them, both of her part-time jobs um, were through um, referrals from SEEK and College Discovery and, and the Youth Matter program. So we're working with our students as well, and we're also creating our alumni wet network, um, because as uh, Council Member uh, Chairperson Barron mentioned, SEEK and College Discovery have been around for about 50 years, so we have an extensive alumni network that we are working with to see as uh, we can get many more opportunities for our students. And those opportunities are, are continue to be available even uh, beyond uh, a bachelor's degree. Yeah. Okay. There's also the, the, the GEOP program, which is a graduate education opportunity program okay. that we are we are talking to our students about as well because there are there are um, you know, with the opportunity programs, as Jasmine spoke about coming from SUNY, there is an opportunity to go from whether it's SUNY, CUNY, private colleges, but to get your associate, your bachelor's, and even your graduate degree at CUNY. So we're talking to our students about that because it is important. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. And just for the record, uh, so that everyone will know, it's actually called the Percy Ellis Sutton yes. Seek. Uh, program and SEEK stands for Search, Elevation, for Education, Elevation, and Knowledge. And Knowledge, right. <laughs> and the, uh, Percy Sutton was uh, one, one of the spearheaders of that. I think yes. it was Arthur Eve who was a yes. part of that. Yes, Perhaps. and HEOP it was renamed after Arthur O. Eve. Right, good. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank Any you. Any further questions? No? Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Next panel, um, first is John Adron Emu from CUNY University Student Senator, Bill uh, Baccalini from New York Foundling, Mia Malik from New York Foundling, and Harriet Lessel from JCCA. Can 
I apologize if I mispronounced anybody's name. Good afternoon. Uh, may you raise your right, hand, right hands. Uh, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council members' questions? Please state your names for the record. My name is Malik, and uh, I do. Uh, Bill Baccalini. John Adoromo. Thank you so much to the panel. And we're coming to the end, but we would like to be able to make sure that we hear your testimony. If you could be succinct, we would appreciate it. Who would like to begin? I'll go. Okay. Greetings. Chairperson Barron, members of the New York City Higher Education Committee, and distinguished guests. My name is John Adoromu, and I'm the chairperson of the City University of New York University Student Senate. USS is the student governance body responsible for re representing 500,000 students that attend CUNY. I also have the distinct pleasure of serving as a CUNY trustee. I received my associate's degree in computer science from CUNY's Borough of Manhattan Community College. I'm currently pursuing a degree in the CUNY Baccalaureate Unique and Interdisciplinary Studies with concentration in computer science and mathematics. The CUNY B program consists of about 500 students, will allow, which allows the opportunity and ability to, to design our own major and attend several colleges. I'm here today to talk about the matters pertaining to the oversight of higher education opportunities for you aging out of foster care. On behalf of all CUNY students, we would like to thank you for your support to the City Council, and let me continue by saying we appreciate the sustenance each year by this body for the Merit Scholarship. We're hoping to have a discussion to make, making that a baseline item in the budget so it would not be imagined as a non-priority in the future. The reality is, in fact, that program assists a lot of our students in the purchase, purchase of essentials such as textbooks, metro cards, if for some reason they have their tuition covered by some other method. And I'm also sure you've heard about the numerous, on numerous occasions on the success of, of the ASAP program, the SEEK, the BMI, the ACE and many others that have gone a long way in alleviating students of the burden of getting a college education vital, vital to the upward mobility. It is of paramount importance that we enhance fi funding for these programs to continue to change lives. In order to assist the youth aging out of foster care system into a life of their own making, it is important we assist them in the ways we can. On behalf of CUNY students, we ask that the New York City legislature take this following actions to help students gain access to quality affordable higher education at the greatest urban university in the world. One, support the expansion of food pantries on all colleges in CUNY. Two, support and encourage our senior colleges to create their own single stop programs, which through city funding currently helps in addressing issues of affordable housing, homelessness, metro cards, for some of the neediest students in community colleges. Three, student emergency funds should be well advertised to all students and mostly these students. Four, that all campuses have a registered nurse at all times on campus. With healthcare at its present cost, it is important to, that all students should, be, should have um, a nurse available to them on, on campus at all times. Five, five, find ways to support formerly incarcerated youth specifically um, they shouldn't have to spend their life catching up after serving time. They should be given the same opp opportunities as the rest of the youth we have. Six, support the passing of the New York State Dream Act so that all of the undocumented youth aging out of foster care are not entirely left out of the conversation or this discussion. Thank you for listening and holding an hearing on this matter. Thank you. And Next I'm open to any questions. Thank you. Okay, so I guess I'm next. Okay. Um, and I will um, do a shortened version 
I'll skip the commercial parks and the generalities. So uh, good afternoon. My name is Harriet LaSalle, and I am the Director of Government Contracts and Advocacy at JCCA. I want to thank the chairs of the General Welfare and Higher Education Committees, Council Member Steve Levin and Inez Barron, and all the committee members for the opportunity to testify at today's hearing. Uh, JCCA is very appreciative of the Council's interest in higher education opportunities for youth aging out of foster care. So I'm going to skip the info about JCCA, which I think you can find from my written testimony. Um, you know, JCCA, like many of the child welfare agencies, is committed to improving the educational outcomes of children in our foster home and residential programs. You've heard about some of them uh, by providing counseling for these young people around educational opportunities and supports. We empower them to envision a successful academic career. Through staff, foster parent, and parent trainings, we equip adults in the child's life to be strong educational advocates. We have a Reading for Our Future program that provides 100 children in foster care with in-home one-on-one tutoring in specific academic areas, and now it's in its seventh year and it's had very positive uh, outcomes. Um, we also have a scholarship program that young adults are eligible to apply to continue their education and funds are available for undergraduate and vocational education. So the, the, the committee has already heard about um, the, the, the challenges that face youth aging out of foster care, so I'm going to skip that part as well. You've, you've gotten many of the statistics. I do want to focus on two issues today. The issue of housing as it relates to higher education and the need for information from CUNY in reference to the Foster Youth Success College Initiative funds. Um, I will, I was going to, you know, I, in my testimony I have this, the story of a young woman who's presently in our care who you've already heard from. And, I, and the housing aspect that I wanted to talk about is that um, when JE uh, first went to school, um, she was very excited to get into a school um, out of the city, Suning Farmingdale, um, and, uh, and thought that experiencing campus life out of the city would be a very positive thing. But what happened was that in a responsible way, when she let NYSHA know, New York City Housing Authority know, um, that her dress was no longer in the city, they... Um, they, uh, so she could receive the correspondence related to her application. Um, unfortunately, they used this information to close her case, citing an out-of-city address, and enforce their policy that an individual cannot reapply for one year. Um, anticipating her need for permanent housing once, you know, once out of care, she made the decision to come back into the city because part of it was also to be eligible for NYSHA housing. And she's still awaiting the determination of her application while she completes her bachelor's degree, but does not know where she's going to live after graduation. Um, so we are all aware of ACS's efforts and advocacy with NYSHA to keep their priority status for youth in foster care and aging out of foster care and finding ways to assist foster youth in navigating the system. We ask for the Council's help by requesting a, view, a review of NYSHA policies that create obstacles for youth who want to attend college. You know, youth aging out of foster care need a coordinated response by all city agencies to help them achieve a future of hope and promise. You know, as we've already spoken about, attaining a college degree is one of the most crucial goals a young person can achieve to help increase their future earnings and success, you know, to ensure that, and to, to ensure that they succeed. Uh, we need to determine how NYSHA can support these young people. A college-going go culture cannot flourish if young people have to worry about where they will live during college breaks and after graduation. So the CUNY dorm is a wonderful, wonderful program, and you know uh, we just need to have um, ongoing supports for young people. Um, and then I just want to say that youth who age out of foster care are some of our most vulnerable citizens, and especially after the supports of ACS and the nonprofit child welfare agencies end. New York City can and must find a way to provide them with ongoing resources to ensure a positive start into independent adulthood, and we all look forward to hearing about um, the task force that's looking at how uh, different city agencies can help young people aging out of foster care. Um, Great, great strides have also been made through the CUNY ACS partnership entitled 
they all have the same names, Fostering College Success Initiative, sorry, and other programs to ensure that foster youth receive the supports they need to get in and stay in college. Um, as a member of the steering committee of the Fostering Youth Success Alliance, we respectfully request that CUNY provide the critical impact data we need about the state funds that support the, col the Foster College Success Initiative. This was the funding that Shirley referred to that was one and a half the first year, three the second year, four and a half million its third year. By having this information, you, we can enable you know, the alliance of which we are part of to continue its efforts to assure that all youth in foster care receive the financial and other supports that will help them succeed in college. Um, children in foster care are already navigating a host of challenges that other young people do not, and which was referenced um, um, by Council Member Levin, lack of family support, and dealing with finances, housing, and health insurance by the tender age of 21. You know, as they have been in the care of New York City, we are responsible for assisting them to achieve a future of hope and promise. And we have the power to create educational equity by removing barriers related to housing and by providing, continuing to provide, financial and supportive resources that will positively contribute to their ability to attend and stay in college. We must do no less. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next panelist. Good afternoon, everyone. My afternoon. name is Malik Mia. I am a first year psychology major at the Borough Manhattan Community College. I currently reside at the Towers at the City College of New York. I've been a part of the Foster, Fostering College Success Initiative dorm project for the past four months. After achieving my GED diploma, my educational specialist for my foster care agency, Catholic Guardian Society, introduced me to the dorm project. I decided to apply to the program in hopes of furthering my education while still remaining in care. In addition to living in the dorms, I've been provided with a vast amount of resources. Some of these resources are a weekly stipend, access to the city college facilities, college success coaching, and academic tutoring. These resources have been a huge support over the past four months. With the weekly stipend, I am able to afford the essential items, essential items rather than having to acquire a job while being a full-time full -time student, I can focus on my studies. The college success coaches and tutors have influenced my personal and academic growth and mindset. With their encouragement and assistance, I was able to stay focused and improve my academic standards. I personally think the foster care college success dorm Excuse me. I personally think the Fostering College Success Dorm Project is the best program for the foster care youth. With an educational environment and a structured foundation, it has helped me to reach for the stars. Being that I am a knowledgeable student, it has been a blessing to wake up in this atmosphere. Through this opportunity, I plan to continue my education, be an active voice for myself and my peers. All praise is thanks to the Creator, who is the cause of my success and failure. Though failure was never an issue, but it, taught, it strengthened me and taught me to never give up. I am happy to take any questions and I will answer it with the best of my ability. Thank you so much. You're Next panelist. Well. Wow. That's a tough act to follow. Um, uh, I submitted written testimony, so I'll just take some time and, and, and focus on some of the things that were raised during, during the hearing. Um, thanks very much for this opportunity. The first thing I'd like to say is that we're very fortunate to live in a city with a city university college system as committed to providing um, um, the kinds of services and supports to the kids like Malik and Jasmine and many others like them. Uh, we, are, we are very, very fortunate. Um, uh, um, I think, Con uh, Councilman Levin, you, you, you first raised this whole, this whole issue of, of um, and with uh, Councilman Rodriguez around the pipeline. And you focused on some attendance rates in high school, and he focused on a pipeline in community college versus uh, 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 getting kids ready to go to school. I, I think we'll, we'll, we'll fool ourselves if we focus just on college. It is the pipeline. The pipeline is critical. And we know that Malik's journey to college and the journey of the foster kids in this city's journey to college is much different than my daughter's journey to college was or your journey to college was. 
the destination's the same. As you suggested three hours ago, these kids have every capacity to learn as any other kid in this city. They've just never been given the opportunity. And so I would suggest to you folks, as you deliberate over the next few months, you know, they talk about a peace dividend. We now have a peace dividend in this city with only 9,000 kids in foster care. 9,000 kids in foster care. Let's do something different. We know their journey to the educational destination of a college degree or a law degree or a doctoral degree. We know their journeys that are different. The destination's the same. We operate a charter school in the Bronx for kids in the child welfare system. We open it up in Mott Haven, two-thirds of every incoming class. The families are either receiving preventive services or the kids are in foster care. We realize what the consequences of trauma is for the educational journey. It's not a linear journey. But it's a journey, nonetheless, that gets us to the same place. I would submit to you that um, for as little as $15 million a year, you can provide one-on-one, -on -one very focused tutoring to every high school youngster in, every youngster in foster care in high school in this city for $15 million. What's the ROI on it? The Foundling, with the help of the Hilton Foundation some four years ago, has quadrupled the number of youngsters going to college in four years. I'm not saying the ideal arrangement is starting tutoring in freshman year, but you know what? We can't, we can't say to another generation of foster care kids, oh, just wait, 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 while we reform the system. We can't, uh, uh, Councilwoman Barron, st again three hours ago, talked about the life trajectory and what a college education did to the life trajectory. So how can I, how can I tell the Maliks of the world Oh, we're going to get there. We're going to get there. We're going to fix it. I'm suggesting there's an opportunity now with so few kids in foster care that we can, we can build some support systems and get next year's juniors and next year's sophomores ready for college so that Donna and her staff, when kids arrive on a CUNY campus, they're much better prepared to actually start a, uh, academic studies. So I, I, and there are a number of other things. I mean, we're currently thinking about another another program where we, we take high school seniors who quite aren't ready yet to, and put them through a gap year. A gap year, uh, not the gap year you wanted, the gap year before you even start school. And what we do is we spend half the week on academics get, to get them ready for college and the other half, half of the week on community service where we stipend them and we pay them, we pay them to uh, do community service and the other 20 hours are academic, uh, spent in academic and then that following year after a gap year, they're really prepared for college. So just a little food for thought. I, um, you know, you guys can read the t testimony and I make some other references to some other things that we can do. I just want to leave you with this thought. Um, capacity, these kids have it. These kids have it so don't ever doubt for a minute that they don't. Um, I think the problem in foster care is historically we've lowered the bar instead of raising the bar. The evidence clearly suggests from the two students you heard from today, from hearing from Donna and from Julie before Donna about, about their capacity. They can do it. And they're, you know, the foundling was mentioned a thousand times today. It's not the foundling. It, there's a number of other, JCCA is a leader in education. There's a number of us in this city that have the capacity to do it. So I, 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 think, I think we've turned a corner. And I, I think if we double down on education, because here's the, here's the other issue, and I'll, and I'll leave with this. Um, and it was raised earlier. It's critical that we get these kids educated because let me tell you this. If you're in one of our programs at age 18 or 19 or 20, I can assure you few of these kids, if they turn around, there aren't many family members with their back. Right, if they've gotten to that point in foster care. So the value of a college degree for me, my daughter, she messes up, she comes home, she knows the door will be open. Your father opened the door and then she just turned your back out. Right, we're there. Malik, there's a lot of pressure on these kids. Right, this is the first generation. Right, and so we have to wrap our arms wrap our arms around them because the value of getting them an education or the consequences of not getting them one is much, much greater. So I'll end it at that, but uh, thank you very much. We want to thank the panel for coming, especially for staying the three hours, <laughs> but it's important that we hear all the testimony. Uh, for, for Malik, I just have a question. How did you 
know about programs for college as a child in care? Well, being in foster care for about six years, uh, I've been introduced to a lot of uh, opportunities in foster care, a lot of uh, vocational resources, such as uh, educational resources. So I heard a lot from my educational specialist. Okay. So my, uh, my agency uh, did a pretty good job helping the youth. Okay, good. And uh, in terms of the programs um, that you talked about, uh, JCCA, repairing the repair the world child by child. So, in terms of housing, what are some of the other conditions or some of the other initiatives that we can look at to be able to expand the opportunity, the opportunity for increased numbers of students who have that major issue? Where are they going to stay? Well, I think. I think it would be very simple. I, I think a lot of it is about looking at the different policies and procedures. So NYCHA is a, you know, it's a city program. I know it's sort of a quasi, but it's a city program. And given that the numbers are so low, we're not, this is not a heavy lift, you know. So for those young people that uh, NYCHA is one of their top choices in terms of where they can live, um, we should be able to make changes in the policies and procedures regarding youth in foster care. The numbers are not that do you large. Know, do you know what the numbers are? Do you have any idea? Uh, for those that have applied for NYSHA? Right. I can find out. Okay. I can find out. I mean, there's another program called New York, New York 3, which is supportive right. housing, supportive. Which, is a very, which is a very wonderful program for a lot of youth in care and obviously having more of those units because it's the kind of thing where it's sort of like, um, it's um, like support while you're independent. So it's preparing people for, to be um, supportive and be able to afford perhaps more market rate, although when you say that in New York, you don't even know what you're talking about, but you know, uh, the kind of apartments that they might get without that kind of um, assistance. Okay, um, Council Member Levin. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Barron. I wanna thank this panel. Um, Every one of you brought something great to the table, and so I want to uh, thank you and acknowledge that. Um, uh, first, uh, John, thank you so much for your testimony. Um, we love it when there are, is a list of actionable <laughs> items, and you had six actionable <laughs> items, so that's very helpful, and we're going to be taking that and making sure that we build upon uh, those recommendations. So thank you very much. And you mentioned, um, I've also, I believe in giving credit where credit's due, you mentioned the merit scholarships. Uh, Chair Barron was instrumental in getting those merit so scholarships restored um, after they were cut. So um, Chair, Chair Barron and her predecessor, Councilmember Charles Barron, um, w w made sure that, that this was a priority of the council. So I want to acknowledge that. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, Harriet, uh, thank you. If you could email uh, your testimony to us as well, because I want to make sure that we forward that over both to NYCHA and to HRA, uh, because we've been in discussions with HRA over making sure that they're, you know, upon aging out, that every young person in the foster care system has access to affordable housing. Um, and, uh, you know, to be clear that there are major gaps um, uh, in uh, what NYCHA is doing, um, because, uh, you know, um, you know, it, it's, it's alarming uh, that um, to see, you know, of all the successful, um, uh, the success that, uh, that Jasmine was um, uh, embodying, um, the idea that she may be facing, um, you know, a housing crisis in, in a few short months uh, is alarming and unacceptable for anybody. So um, we want to make sure that that, that issue is uh, getting highlighted and there's a spotlight on that um, moving forward. Um, and uh, to uh, Malik, thank you so much for your uh, excellent testimony and for um, bringing your story uh, here to the City Council and making sure that, uh, that, that we are going to be building upon um, uh, the issues that you've raised in your story. And, and so, um, you know, we wish you all the success and we, are, are, we, we could see what a, uh, how much promise uh, you have. And so we're really, um, we look forward to, 
to, to, to watching your successes in the future. So I want to thank you. Um, and, uh, and, and Bill, thank you so much for your uh, passion and for, um, and I, one thing about uh, what you raised, $15 million, uh, making sure that, that you know, the, the Department of Education budget, um, I haven't looked at it in a while, but I think it's probably about $25 billion a year. Um, so 15 million out of 25 billion is a little bit less uh, than 0.1 percent of the DOE budget annually. So when looked in, you know, 15 million sounds like a lot of money, um, but when we have, uh, you, know, uh, 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 you know, these massive budgets, it's a drop in the bucket. It's, it's five five thousand um, dollars um, a student, and what you'll see happen to the college admissions and readiness rates will 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 curl your hair. Thank you very much for bringing that to us, and I look forward to acting upon that. So thank you so much, and I'll turn it thank back you. over to my co-chair. Thank you. Um, seeing no other persons wishing to offer testimony, we're going to close this hearing. Thank you so much for coming.